screen up. Can everyone see the appropriate screen and hear me fine? Yes, it looks great and sounds great. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Feig, and I am here together with Richard Wiener, who is my colleague at Research Corporation for Science Advancement. And this morning, I want to tell you about a program that will be forthcoming in September um, called Scilog, uh, Mitigating Zoonotic Threats. And this is a partnership through um, um, a non-assistance uh, non cooperative agreement with USDA. And so I want to thank Jeff Silverstein, Roxanne Matroni, and Kim Dodd, who are our contacts at uh, USDA, who have been working with us both here at uh, um, the conference this week, but also in planning uh, Scilog. So let me tell you a little bit about what Scilog is and why I am talking to you today. So this is a program that was started in 2010, and Scilog comes from a contraction of science and dialogue. And it is a program that we at Research Corporation for Science Advancement have been running to spur collaborative science in interdisciplinary spaces, and in particular to support early career scientists. And this is part of our mission. I should say that Research Corporation for Science Advancement is in fact the oldest scientific funding uh, philanthropy in the country. We're a uh, little over 109 years old. And uh, we were founded with a mission to support interdisciplinary and, uh, science and early career faculty from um, some early donations of intellectual property from uh, uh, Frederick Gardner Cottrell, who was a faculty member at Berkeley and developed the first pollution control device in the early 1900s used in coal fa powered fire plants. And we've developed an endowment based on that and work in this space uh, ever since. So what this is, is an experimental approach to um, accelerate multidisciplinary science and catalyze new network formation among the, its participants. We focus on collaboration and conversation about future science, and it's a mechanism to then provide um, sandbox grants to the participants to drive science into new directions. And so uh, it is both a convening, but also a funding opportunity for the participants. The structure of Scilog, it's three days long. We invite 50 fellows. So it's a invitation only event. And we have typically around 10 established leaders in the field who we call facilitators, as well as guests who are program officers from uh, interested not-for-profits and other funding agencies who are working in the same space. Also attending tend to be RCSA staff and scientists um, who uh, help organize and uh, facilitate the conversations. And so the session structure is mostly group discussions ranging from uh, uh, whole group discussions of the cohort of about 70 people who might be at the meeting, uh, down to small group, targeted group discussions of three or four. And the idea is to focus on what future knowledge is necessary to solve critical si uh, societal problems. Um, and so we run these in a variety of areas. We are running six this year. Uh, we just ran one uh, last week in the area of the gut-brain axis, so microbiome neurobiology disease. You can see here the different initiatives that are ongoing. And each initiative lasts three to four years and uh, develops the community within that space. And here today, I'm uh, gonna be talking in a little bit more detail about the Mitigating Zoonotic Threats Initiative that will be running from September 30th to October 3rd of uh, this year and then continuing in late September uh, for three additional years. So what the MZT event is going to do is bring together early career scientists from a variety of disciplines. We've seen here at the NBAF symposium that uh, many of them are represented here as well. So public health, veterinary science, epidemiology, disease surveillance, you guys uh, in that space obviously get together and, uh, and talk regularly, but you are off, that community is less engaged with computational biology sometimes, analytical chemistry that may be developing new devices to monitor uh, and surveil um, new outbreaks or new disease and also uh, anti-infective and vaccine development. And so we are trying to bring together communities that don't know each other in some uh, capacity so that we can catalyze the conversations among the appropriate stakeholders. So the goals for Scilog 
are to engage in a, a conversation that will accelerate high risk, high reward science in the area of zoonotic disease. The conversations are designed to analyze the bottlenecks that are impeding preparedness and develop approaches to surmount those barriers. We want to build a creative transdisciplinary community that bridges both the USDA scientists as well as academic scientists and partners in the nonprofit space. And this is why we have been contacted and uh, are working with the folks at NBAF because as part of the move to Kansas from the Plum Island facility, they wanted to um, redevelop some additional contacts uh, and connections between these different communities. Teams will uh, form at the event. They will write proposals on the site and these will allow the um, funding of seed projects uh, to highlight the innovative ideas that emerge from that dialogue. And in the background, we also conduct research on team science and on the nature of collaboration formation. And so in the last couple of minutes, I wanna tell you a little about what we learn and how the the structure of the meeting actually is designed in order to enhance, enhance um, our understanding of how and when collaborations form. So we actually use an analytic approach to pair scientists during the meeting. People uh, will propose topics in advance of the conference. They'll also report their own knowledge of each other participant. And so we follow them as dyads and triads. And over time, what we think about is who ultimately chooses to either uh, write a proposal together or who ultimately publishes or writes funding requests together. So here you see a schematic network that is um, across several disciplines. They're not highly connected, uh, but a few people may have trained together. And so there are a few pre-existing connections prior to Sialog. We can then follow these connections as a function of who spoke to whom during the meetings because we assign and track those kinds of interactions and how long each interaction is during the conference. And then after the conference is um, out into the, the post-conference, post-Sialog period, we monitor things like publications, grants, and patents for all of the participants. And we do this through a proprietary database that we contract with. So we can see at some point in time, additional publications and patents may have found been uh, written between participants, and this continues to grow and evolve over time. And, uh, and we have the ability to study the formation of those networks. We also collaborate with a um, professor at Northwestern, Professor Danny Abrams, who's in applied mathematics, and he has been developing nonlinear dynamics models of both dyad and triad interactions that look at the impact of the, the types of sessions fellows interact in, and then whether they choose to write proposals together. This provides data on the boundary conditions for how much interaction is required to build trust, yielding an, a new collaboration. And um, now in the era of COVID, we have been actually able to start comparing the impact of virtual meetings on the formation of collaboration as opposed to in-person meetings. And this has obvious implications for future conferences in terms of how do we design um, more inclusive events where people can't travel to be in the same space. And then we use these data to continually improve the conferences and maximize the impact on team formation. So just to give you an, uh, uh, a quick taste of what, what it is that we can see here are three of our Sialog initiatives in other spaces. They, uh, 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 data was pulled in early January, and what you can see for the uh, Advanced Energy Storage Initiative, there were about 5,200 papers published by our participants uh, from the three-year event, of which 181 were from teams that formed at Sialog. And I'm not, I don't have time to talk about how we um, uh, determine that, but we can we can show that those those are the new teams. There are significant disciplinary differences. So if, if you look at TDA, the Time Domain Astrophysics Group, uh, what this tells us is that astrophysics publishes vastly more uh, papers and vastly more large team papers than um, advanced battery storage. And we can track this as well. Uh, and so what you see here are, uh, is just a time course of the publications and in purple, those are the new teams that are formed after Sialog, whereas yellow are the publications of people who knew each other and interacted with each other in advance of Sialog. And so we can, we can see that the yellow uh, bars aren't changing significantly. They continue to collaborate in the manner that they did before, but the new publications grow in um, 
and stabilize by about three years after the start of the initiative. And we for the initiatives that were our first known initiatives, these co-publication networks are sustained for at least five years. And so we can uh, use this kind of information to understand how scientific conferences of uh, different formats lead to new collaboration. So we do have an ask for you. So we're trying to help identify the um, topics that are most critical to include in our discussion threads relating to the basic science required for preparedness for the next pandemic. And here's a link that you can use. It will take you to a survey monkey form that will allow you to enter discussion threads as they come to you. Haley will put that into the chat box uh, so that you can enter today or throughout the rest of the conference. And then let me I just end with uh, a couple links for you as well. Uh, one link is to the Scilog MZT website if you want more information. And the second link is for a nomination form if you have um, somebody who you think should be participating in this, uh, particularly early career scientists who uh, are either from USDA or in academic settings who would then benefit from being part of this program. And with that, I will and in fact, uh, uh, John Epstein, who is our moderator for today, he is Vice President for Science and Outreach at EcoHealth Alliance. And John, I will hand it to you. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everybody. Um, really interesting. I think that the biggest message we always hear and give to uh, young scientists is how important collaboration is. So it's nice to see efforts like this underway that really help to enrich collaboration and encourage it. Um, well, anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here this morning. It's a real pleasure, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate this session. Um, it's a stellar lineup, but really esteemed colleagues talking about some important viruses and the, the dynamics and impacts they have on livestock, humans, and wildlife. And I just want to remind everyone before we begin that if you do have questions, please write them into the Q&A box, and we'll try to answer those live after the speaker um, speaks or in writing if possible. And then we'll have time for discussion during our roundtable as well at the end of the entire session. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who's a friend and colleague, Dr. Brian Bird. He's the Associate Director of the One Health Institute and Director of the One Health Institute Laboratory at the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of California, Davis. And this morning, he'll be speaking about One Health approaches to zoonotic virus surveillance at the Wildlife Human Interface, talking about Ebola, Lhasa, Crimean, Congo, Congo, Crimea, <laughs> CCHF. I haven't had my coffee this morning. Anyway, Brian, over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, Haley, it would appear I can't uh, share. Oh, here we go. Thank you. All right. Hopefully everyone can see me and my slide. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Bird looks great. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, John. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to be able to contribute a bit uh, in this uh, space uh, as we talk about the science and the buildup to the opening of NBAF and the tremendous technological and uh, technical capacity gain that'll be for, the, for our country uh, in the coming decades. So. Uh, my, my talk today uh, is, is slightly redacted due to time, uh, which I think is fine. Uh, I'm going to be talking about One Health approaches to zoonotic virus surveillance, but focusing primarily on Ebola and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, or CCHF. For those of you that are arena virus or rodent fans, I'm sorry I had to cut that bit out, but uh, hopefully you won't be disappointed. And I uh, just want to say that, you know, we are all here working on uh, zoonotic viruses, zoonotic diseases, bacteria, fungi, uh, whatever that might be. But I, really a, a thrust of my talk is keeping the focus also on the people where these diseases exist and in, in their endemic nature, the people that really do suffer uh, when uh, these uh, highly, con highly contagious or high consequence pathogens emerge and spill over from their reservoir hosts. Uh, you know, and this is just this slide up front, uh, my group at UC Davis, uh, we have a very dynamic group at the One Health Institute. And I think my laboratory, we focus on several different diseases, but really it's focused at this wildlife to human interface and how the interactions of these two populations allow for virus spillover and spread. So today, two, two zoonotic viruses, two vignettes of work that, that I've done uh, 
in collaboration with many others over the years. Uh, the first part about Ebola viruses or filoviruses more broadly, talking about Ebola and Marburg. Uh, this is just a life cycle cartoon from the CDC. Uh, speaking to that, you know, we know that uh, filoviruses, uh, certainly Marburg and most likely most other Ebola viruses are reservoired by various species of bats. We don't know exactly which species of bats for some of those viruses, but you know, there's an endemic cycling of these viruses in their natural reservoir, expected to have no disease consequence at all or hardly any in those reservoir species. And that virus circulates in those animals routinely. You know, it, the viruses do what they what they have evolved to do over millennia, uh, but then you know there some event will occur where a virus will spill out, uh, be transmitted out of that reservoir species into either an intermediate host like a non-human primate here represented by a chimpanzee or some other uh, species like a dacre antelope here for Ebola viruses, and then humans come into contact with that virus either from the bat itself, uh, from the bat urinating or defecating on a food source, like a, a mango, you could imagine that scenario, or they hunt and kill bats and you consume bats as bush meat or food protein sources, or they hunt and kill or come in contact with these intermediate hosts. And then for Ebola is really, you know, it's a, you, oftentimes a single spillover event, you know, one index case, one person starts the chain of transmission, and then it's this wave of infection amongst the humans, right? Uh, that could be different from Marburg, where you could have multiple spillovers, so just because of the, the uh, epidemiology of that virus and how that works. And then the, on the other end of the spectrum, we're going to sp spend a bit of time at the very end of the talk here, the brief talk about Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is a tick-borne uh, bunivirus. And this is a really a, a very classic a One Health pathogen where, you know, this is a tick-borne virus. Uh, the ticks, hyaloma species ticks, feed on a variety of wild animals. Uh, they're quite uh, agnostic to what they feed on at early stages uh, in their development, but then eventually feed on livestock, cattle, uh, sheep, and goats. And then people become involved in the transmission cycle, either from direct bites by the hyaloma ticks, which if any of you have ever worked with hyalomas in the field, you know they're very aggressive, very fast moving ticks. Uh, but more than likely people come in contact with it through food sources. So through the slaughtering and butchering of livestock animals. Right? What's interesting about uh, CCHF virus is in these uh, intermediate hosts, these wild animals or livestock, there's no disease at all. None that we can has ever really been detected. But when that virus gets into people, it can be a very high, high fatality infection with severe consequences and eventually a hemorrhagic syndrome. Okay. So the common themes here really are looking at the animal reservoir, intermediate hosts, and people, right? So we're comparing and contrasting here filoviruses and uh, a tick-borne bunivirus, CCHF. But the common themes are really these both have potential for major outbreaks and endemic transmission across uh, Africa. You know, the filovirus is the largest outbreak ever in West Africa, about 28,000 cases of Ebola Zaire infection. CCHF is very different uh, uh, epidemic cycle, oftentimes periodic localized outbreaks, uh, a small cluster in a, in a farming family or, or a perhaps nosocomial transmission across much of and parts of Asia, right? But what really is important is you think about controlling these outbreaks require major international effort and, and expenditure of funds, time and sweat and tears, and oftentimes through the uh, lives lost amongst healthcare workers. So ongoing surveillance for these uh, infections is critical. And you can see here on the right, it's, here's, here's your uh, complimentary loss of fever example of my, my team in Sierra Leone doing loss of fever surveillance in rodents. But it's having this ongoing surveillance, looking for these pathogens at the reservoir human interface is critical. Uh, I think that our experiences with COVID-19 have completely changed how we think about this paradigm. And hopefully a lot more emphasis will be placed on that in the future to look for pathogens, understand the natural transmission cycles, and then what can we do to abrogate spillover and eventual emergence and then human human transmission of these uh, uh, viruses in this case. But the central take home message of my talk, if you take away one thing, it's that it doesn't matter what pathogen you're working on, whether it's cows or sheep or goats or lizards or turkeys or whatever, don't care. It's that all of our work begins and ends in a community, right? And having that community on board with our work is essential. I challenge our uh, collective scientific community to deeply engage 
with social scientists, uh, behavioral interventionists, and others that know this system very, very well to augment our efforts. As we go out and look in the forest and uh, you know, beat the bushes and try to find these reservoir hosts and understand spillover, if we don't have the people in the communities on board, uh, we won't be successful because the whole reason we're doing this is to save lives, whether it be animal lives or human lives are together through a One Health approach, increasing the uh, health and vitality of both of those communities. So to the filoviruses. So, you know, filoviruses have been around for quite a long time. We've known since 1967, at least about Marburg and 76 for Ebola's. And I'm going to talk just briefly about a project that myself and Dr. Epstein have worked on previously called the PREDICT project, which was a USAID funded project to really look at the animal origins of these viruses and understand the spillover dynamics uh, for Ebola viruses and uh, Marburg viruses. And uh, here's just two images. One I took while I was a, a uh, uh, research scientist at CDC in Uganda, a Ebola virus outbreak. And then here's a picture actually of Dr. Epstein right here. He might recognize that picture from Liberia uh, where we were working on standing up their team there in Liberia for these surveillance efforts. But really it's about finding the viruses before they find us. And part of that, uh, part of my job was to leave what was called the Ebola host project, which was a part of the much larger PREDICT project, which worked in over 30 countries. Our focus was looking for animal origins of Ebola viruses in three countries. Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, which were the countries that were devastated in the West Africa uh, uh, epidemic in 2013 to 2016. And really our, our strategy and our focus was on filovirus surveillance, but also building in-country capacity. Because as I mentioned before, these viruses exist in, in nature somewhere, right? So another challenge I put to our community is to build the capacity in the teams working in the countries where we work and where the diseases are to be able to tackle these challenges uh, themselves, right? So our sampling strategy was really focused on two major taxa, really bats as the primary reservoirs looking for the animal origin, spillover hosts, but then some sampling along the domestic animal interface to look for spillback and other spillover hosts that might have been involved in that, that, that very, very large uh, regional uh, epidemic. And as I mentioned, the underlying goal, of course, is capacity training in this particular project, especially uh, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. It certainly trained hundreds of people to do uh, various aspects of the project training ranging from bat ecology and field expedition surveillance, laboratory testing, data management, and the like. And really, it was part of this augmenting the stand up of One Health platforms in these three countries. Yeah. And when you look at what we accomplished, I mean, my teams at UC Davis, uh, in Sierra Leone and Guinea, and then Dr. Epstein's team in Liberia, really, really changed the, 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 our understanding of uh, animal biodiversity and viral surveillance in West Africa. So here's some of the sites. Over about a two and a half year period, we sampled almost 20,000 animals and more than half of those were bats uh, from various species. And so huge, deep look into viral ecology in West Africa and, and results will be coming from this for many, many, many years. But I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, uh, key findings from that, uh, focusing primarily on Sierra Leone, uh, our implementing partners, partners there with the University of McKinney and the Ministry of Health and Sanitation and Agriculture and Forestry. And it's that partnership that was really what allowed us to make great strides in the country with the discovery of an entirely new species of Ebola virus, uh, which is now called Bombalee Ebola virus. And in a co-discovery with our great colleagues at the CDC Viral Special Pathogens Branch, John Towner, Brian Allman, and others, uh, the discovery of Marburg virus in West Africa for the first time. So, for the Bombali virus, we were looking for animal origins of Zaire Ebola, the one that caused the regional pandemic 2013-2016. And in the search for that, we found a completely new species of Ebola virus that no one knew about uh, because, well, no one had really at that point to that stage been able to look deep, 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 sample, 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 longitudinal surveillance, multiple tacks of deep into the different species of bats that are circulating uh, across these countries in West Africa. And we detected a signature for what appeared to be a novel Ebola virus, and sure enough, it was. Uh, what we do know now is Bumbley virus certainly has the ability to enter into human cells. It, our work on determining could this be a potential human pathogen is ongoing. Um, it does seem to have a mixed phenotype landing probably somewhere between a Ebola virus, which is 
more or less asymptomatic and not pathogenic in humans to Zaire, which would be the most highly pathogenic early variant of our species of Ebola we have. Uh, and what's interesting about uh, uh, Bombali is that we found it in Sierra Leone first, and then a team uh, quite soon after that uh, reported discovery of the same virus using similar techniques in Guinea, just the country just to the north, but then all the way across in Kenya, which I'll speak to in a second. Uh, so uh, very interesting there. Same for Marburg. You know, Marburg virus typically thought of as East Africa or Southern Africa virus. Uh, our co-discovery with our CDC colleagues uh, extended the map tremendously all the way across to West Africa. And what's interesting about Bombalia virus is you know, myself and you know, I think the, the, the general wisdom at the time was thinking of Ebola viruses as spilling over from large uh, mega chiropteric bats or frugivorous bats. Uh, you're thinking of the large bats and not necessarily focused extensively on insectivorous bats. Uh, in Ebola host project, we, we just sampled bats. We tried to be as agnostic as possible, knowing that finding the origins of uh, Ebola Zaire is very difficult uh, based on the decades of work that's been done on that. So in our sampling of these uh, um, animals, we detected bumblebee in two species of, of insectivorous bats, uh, Mops condylaris and Caifron pumilus. These are co-roosting bats that oftentimes are found in people's homes, uh, right? So the, the dwelling structures in West Africa uh, typically have thatched roofs or metal roofs that are open, you know, those, uh, typically not glass windows or screens and the like. So these bats live in people's homes. So What's interesting about this virus is that there's really potential for very close contact between a reservoir host, in this case, most likely the Mops condylaris bat, uh, and humans, right? So it's this very close uh, interaction of the bats and people that really could potentiate spillover of that virus, right? And it's finding that virus, uh, Dr. Epstein and their group also found signatures of Ebola Zaire virus in bats there, but that's his story. I'll let him tell that story as he goes along. Uh, it's really this hand-in-hand -hand partnership with our work in our communities and with our government colleagues that allowed us to report this information out to the country, but not completely cause panic and turmoil in the country that had recently been devastated by a human-to-human -human, uh, transmission of Zaire virus. Right? And then in just the last minutes is here, I wanted to touch on this project. I, there's not a lot of data here, but again, talking about the development of capacity. So this is a project focused on Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever and tick-borne disease surveillance in West and East Africa. Uh, we're very fortunate to be part of a, of a collaborative effort uh, with uh, colleagues at the CDC, USDA ARS, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch to put together a comprehensive surveillance project and epidemiology project for CCHF, looking at both ticks and livestock at, in West Africa, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, but also following through with the molecular pathogenesis work uh, at UTMB and CDC that we need to do to be able to build countermeasures for this virus to protect animals and people. Now here's a picture of our field sites in our two countries. Uh, UC Davis in partnership with University of McKinney and Sokooni University of Agriculture, we're leading this uh, field ecology effort. And then ticks and specimens and genomic information will be fed into the laboratory pipelines at the other partners uh, for a detailed workup of that virus. Of course, this work has been delayed by COVID. That's why there's not much data here, but I did want to highlight this because it's a really important thing, building capacity for both these countries, but also for NBAF. Part of this uh, is a training program for postdoctoral scientists to eventually uh, find their way to NBAF and contribute to the scientific mission there. Here's just some images of that project. With that, I'll stop uh, and be happy to discuss with uh, Dr. Epstein and others questions that you might have and talk about anything you would like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's excellent. I mean, it really was tremendous work that you and the team did and the project did in, in West Africa. I want to start with a question. You really emphasize the importance of community engagement. And I think that's so true, particularly because that's where spillover happens. Can you talk about how, you know, when you're out there finding viruses, especially Ebola viruses, which carry their own type of sensitivities, how do you balance the, the conservation or ecological messaging with the message that you're finding a lethal zoonotic virus when you're talking to the local community? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a great question, John. And I think uh, is, is the, it's maybe the million, the million dollar question, right? Of how do you 
do these uh, virus discovery projects or even you know pathogen discovery. So CCHF, we've known about that for a long time, but we're finding it in different places, right? Uh, so how do you inform a community about that? that? Okay, so now an animal that they've coexisted with for as long as they would ever remember, uh, now may harbor uh, a potentially deadly pathogen, all right? So thinking about Ebola's or Marburg's and bats, for example. And really, you know, we think about uh, wildlife ecology, viral ecology, spillover of emerging viruses and things, yeah, you know, from wildlife conservation people, and they're these dis disparate groups, but really a central theme in all of these, at least the viruses I work on, uh, you know, Ebola's, loss of fever, CCHF, these are really food-based issues, right? So it's people coming in contact with the wildlife and getting exposed through either hunting or consumption of these animals, right? So they're used to uh, killing these animals. So now you come and say, okay, now in the animals in your community, there may be a deadly virus. So, you know, one of our key things is letting people understand the risks, but also understanding the risk that if they went out and just killed all of the bats, let's say in their community, and they tried to eradicate them, uh, that that would be highly counterproductive. There's lots of literature and scientific data that show that you know, if you try to extirpate, uh, extirpate a particular species in an area, well, they're just gonna come back. And the ones that come back uh, likely will carry their own set of viruses or other pathogens and actually increase transmission. Uh, you know, so it's very difficult. And that's where we rely heavily on the community engagement, community thought leaders, uh, engaging with the traditional leaders. Because uh, also you don't, you don't only need partnerships with the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Ag, but also what is the local power structure? Is there, are there traditional leaders, traditional chiefs, in particular in Sierra Leone, West Africa, thinking about that, that are pow empowered to be able to think about things and then put their community on the right footing to not just destroy nature to protect themselves when actually that's just completely counterproductive. And just a follow up to that, and then I'll get to some participant questions. What was your experience um, in response to the discovery of Bombali virus, both from the local level and at the government level? Uh, you know, reactions varied uh, tremendously. Uh, you know, of course, the government was extremely concerned, and rightfully so. Uh, so the discovery came you know, pretty much on the heels of a, just an absolutely devastating outbreak of, of Ebola for them, right? And you know, it's law, the, the dif difference between Ebola, Zaire, and you know, Thai forest and all these things are lost on, on most people that aren't uh, virology wonks. So Ebola is Ebola. Uh, so they were quite concerned about how we do this. So we spent a, lo a lot of time working uh, through their uh, structures, uh, communication structures, you know, public health uh, uh, outreach structures to develop a plan where we could roll out the information first at the national level and then pretty much immediately go out with teams um, to these communities. So some of the pictures early on I showed was actually engagement around our, Mar our Marburg virus finding of people talking with the community that could be come in contact with that. And you know what's interesting is uh, I think at the community level, uh, people were very, in general, much more thankful than panicked. Uh, I was very, very pleased to see that or hear about that. I didn't go on these trips. So I think that's another important thing. You know, is the messages like these need to be brought by the people of the community or the, you know, the local structures, not, not by some guy from the outside. Um, so that was really important. And they were thoughtful, engaged, concerned, definitely. Uh, but uh, I really uh, appreciated that someone actually came back and told them about the results that they had. And that's another thing we've got to get better at as an international community of actually getting our results back to the people where it matters the most. That's great. Um, this is a, a more virologic question for you from Amaresh Das, but it's a question about what you see in terms of mutation in Ebola viruses. And also, what are we learning about the diversity of Ebola viruses with the discovery of Bombali, with the expansion of range of Marburg? But what's your sense of, you know, do we start to see variants with Ebola viruses like we have with SARS-CoV-2? Mm, yeah, that's, that's a really nice question. Um, you know, one of the reasons we see all the variants uh, for SARS-CoV-2 is that there's just this unparalleled uh, transmission in the human population, right? So 
for variants to pop up, you really need the sustained human-to-human uh, -human transmission uh, waves if you're going to see uh, variants that might eventually have phenotypic outcomes of, from variant to strain, if you will. Uh, when you look at the Bumblebee uh, genomic diversity of Bumblebee that we have thus far, we don't very we don't know very much to be honest. Uh, we have complete genomes of the Bumblebee viruses from West Africa. Uh, I believe there are genomes in development from the East Africa uh, collections, if you will. Uh, but you have to think about it. I mean, that's about 5,000, 5,500 kilometers apart. And, and what's, I think, uh, unexpected, well, expected but unanticipated, I guess, was the finding of, of Bumblebee from East to West, right? And I think that shows that our comprehension of filoviruses um, especially Ebola viruses, you know, we've, we've thought of them historically as you know, occurring from outbreaks in certain places, right? And, and I believe quite strongly now, especially coupled with Marburg, that wherever you find these reservoir hosts, so Rosetta aegyptiacus for Marburg, uh, Mops condolores, most likely for Bombali, wherever you find those bats, and that, you know, that, and that extends up into Egypt and across the Middle East for uh, ro rosies, you might very likely find Marburg, right? So it's the geographic spread of these uh, viruses is much more broad than we think. And very likely a lot, a lot more filoviruses will fill in the spectrum of the genomic sequence space as we keep looking and digging deeper and deeper. Yeah, yeah I think it speaks to the importance of the surveillance efforts to, to fill in those gaps and the in the spectrum of viruses out there. Well, Brian, I wanna thank you for an excellent talk. Um, we'll have more discussion during the panel, but we're gonna move on to our next speaker. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thanks for the opportunity, appreciate it. Our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christy Mayo. She's the head of virology and sample receiving sections at Colorado State University's Diagnostic Medicine Center. And today she's gonna to be discussing the epidemiology of blue tongue virus in the United States, implications for arbor virology at the wildlife livestock interface. Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Um, can everyone see my screen or can someone Please indicate if you can. Okay. Yes, Dr. Mayo, we see your PowerPoint, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Okay, thank you so much. Perfect. Okay. So, um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about kind of some of the broad epidemiolo epidemiology of blue tongue and kind of the implications as um, some epidemiology studies have allowed us to advance into ne the next level of understanding the interface of three big components. So um, coming at it from culicoides, which is the common vector, the midge, um, the virus itself, and then this um, ruminant interface. So between our livestock and wildlife interface. So without further ado, let's start. And so thinking about culicoides transmitted diseases, um, there's a number of these diseases that we think about in the context of the United, United States. Blue tongue virus and epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus are of key importance. Um, I'm gonna focus my talk here today mostly on blue tongue virus, um, but thinking about it also in the context of things that are not on our soils, but African horse sickness and some of the threats that could be um, at that interface. But looking at aculicoides, uh, sonorensis is the primary vector that we've studied here in North America, but um, this is a representation of the culicoides midge. And I was just wanna highlight that it's different than the common mosquito. It's much smaller. It's sometimes difficult to study. And I'm gonna highlight some of the key um, differences and, and some of the key um, components of understanding disease ecology in that way. But I also wanna highlight other culicoides transmitted viruses, um, Akabani and Schmollenberg that have also been of topical importance, especially in, in Europe. And so when you think about the cycle of transmission, um, typically we think about Culicoides sonorensis here in North America, but there are other vector species, especially in the Southeast that are of considerable importance. But in the transmission cycle, we think of um, Culicoides, uh, you know, biting on uh, sheep and or cattle, um, domestic species, but we also wanna think about our wildlife species um, as well. So both domestic and wild ruminant species can be affected. And then in the context of what orvi viruses are, they're 
segmented. So there's also this potential for reassortment. And I'll be highlighting some of the, the findings in some of our, our studies that with this reassortment potential um, evolution processes. And so there are 10 segments of double-stranded RNA. And at least 29 serotypes characterized by this segment two have been, um, have been reported thus far. And five of those are considered endemic here within the US. And so when we think about blue tongue, we primarily think about it as a disease of, of sheep, um, rarely in cattle. And so you'll see here some of the key clinical findings are some nasal discharge, sometimes ulcerations um, within the mouth and oral cavity, and then or around the coronary bands inflammation as well. And so as I mentioned, this is primarily we think of a, a disease in sheep. We did have an epidemic in 2006 that hit Europe, and that was blue tongue virus serotype 8. And the key difference was we had um, clinical findings severely affecting some of the cattle populations. So again, this was a, a pretty serious epidemic, um, and we're still seeking answers and understanding some of the, the, the uh, key questions that um, occurred in that epidemic. And so I want to highlight some of the global dynamics. And so this is based off um, publication um, in 1994 when there is a, a kind of estimation of what the global range was. But I want to highlight that there are changing global dynamics. And so some of these key, um, to point your direction, some of these key changes are within each of these shaded regions, kind of I'm highlighting some of the key vector species and the serotypes of blue tongue that typically are um, being transmitted in these regions. But highlights are in the changing global dynamics is that there has been northern expansion of these um, virus incidents. And so when we think about in Europe in the 2006 with BTV8, we not only had expansion, but also some key new uh, species of culicoides that were competent for um, transmitting this virus. So kind of highlighting that feature but as we move over into North America and the United States, a few key things to focus on is I've mentioned that C. sonorensis has been the best well-characterized vector, but there are other species that are clearly documented, especially in the Southeast that are transmitting or potentially have the potential to transmit this virus. Other key things that I wanna highlight is also that um, while we have some of the five key um, endemic serotypes that have been characterized, there are other serotypes BTV3, especially, that's moving um, beyond the southeast and, and um, being transmitted in other portions of the United States. So recognizing the changing global dynamics of the, this virus and how important it is for our ruminant communities and understanding. And so in that, I think we have to understand where the northern limits and our understanding of key vector species are. And, uh, Dr. Lissick uh, in 2014 published a key study in looking at, if we look at the boundary between, oh, apologies, the boundary between this is the US and Canada, we do see that there are key species of C. sonorensis, uh, Culicoides sonorensis, with each red dot represented in Cal and, um, Canada. So understanding some of the key vector species and where their distributions are um, and exploring that space are really pivotal in understanding the epidemiology of the virus and the insect. And so I'd like to highlight some of the key um, epidemiological work that we've done in the past and how that's um, kind of moving us into the future of understanding the ecology. And I want to highlight the importance of really um, important field work um, and the culicoides field work that we've done in the past. And one of these was um, looking at in 2012, we were looking at what trap method and can, would be most beneficial in understanding uh, infected midge rates. So how can we better characterize and collect midges um, or culicoides, sorry, uh, I'm gonna use those words interchangeably, but how could we best get a parameter estimate for our models um, from doing key collections? And so I had done a study where we did animal baited aspirations, CO2 traps and, and UV light traps. and we found out of that study that CO2 traps um, did highlight a key method for trapping infected midges. And later, Dr. McDermott, Emily McDermott, who's now based at the University of Arkansas, she was able to take the study a bit further 
and also um, identify that CO2 traps did collect um, more um, midges that, uh, with their mean infection rate that was higher as compared to UV and CO2 and UV light traps. So it was nice to understand that that was a key trapping method. However, she took this work a bit further. And I think this highlights some of the key things that our work does is um, both with the field and then coming back to the laboratory, Dr. McDermott was able to orally infect some midges. And what we're looking at here, and we had some controls, but what we were looking at here is that this is the ocular regions of the midges. And she was able to identify that there is actually a strong si signal for viral deposition in these BTV infected midges. And so it's a hypothesized that potentially there's viral damage and that could reduce visual acuity. So potentially these midges that are actually infected um, are going to these CO2 traps versus light cues. And so some really nice findings from Emily and Dr. McDermott's work. But I wanna step back a little bit and just highlight the importance of understanding the population ecology as well. So um, in some of this work, we had actually looked at what um, the seasonal nature and also larval habitat and what that might have a contribution to Culicoides populations. And a couple of key findings when we removed a lagoon, um, which should be the actual larval habitat, um, or what we hypothesized <laughs> where we can find larval habitat, we actually did not have a significant difference. If nothing else, we seem to have no effect on adult midge rates um, for the seasonal nature of, uh, of these uh, Culicoides. But another key finding is we were actually able to find some Paris females, so females within the winter time um, that highlighted the importance of both overwintering dynamics and potentially seasonality of these insects. And the reason I bring this up and these kind of ecology studies and fieldwork based studies is all of this has derived important parameter estimates for our modeling efforts. And so in California, we've actually done uh, a pretty um, extensive process with building this model. And this is, represents the seasonality with red indicating um, when the actual um, season and, and transmission would be occurring. And so we're hoping to take these efforts and build them into our Colorado studies as well. And so definitely, I think highlighting the importance and building on Dr. Bird's talk of collaboration, discussions, and uh, attempting to get some of the data on the ground in order to build back into our model systems. And so with that field work and highlighting some of the key components of that, I wanna bring it back to some of the viral laboratory work that we're doing now um, at Colorado. And one thing that our work has been wanting to do is capitalize on next generation sequencing. And so largely what we uh, characterize blue tongue, and I've mentioned this kind of earlier, was on the segment two characteristics. So what encodes for the bioprotein two. And so you'll often hear about blue tongue in the context of serotypes and how they're uh, moving about. But our laboratory is really wanting to characterize blue tongue beyond just the serotype and look at the whole genome um, and really characterize viruses for all 10 segments. And not only that, um, we also want to understand a bit more of the genetic um, evolution and, and diversification. So some of the questions now that we're exploring is how does blue tongue virus evolve? Many groups have um, identified that reassortment and or sometimes what's genetic shift um, with two parental strains co-infecting a single cell, there can be a possibility just like flu where there can be segments that, that swap their genetic parts. And so this would be a classic case of reassortment and that's what our group is really trying to kind of characterize and understand. And so with that, we've taken a lot, um, many of the, the California isolates that um, from, you know, kind of a spectrum of years uh, from the field. And this is Dr. Justin Lee's work where he's actually been able to, this is just representing two different segments, but he's, able, he's been able to do whole genome sequencing and then analysis where we're actually finding, these are color coded by serotype, so that's segment two, but we're actually finding when you see these lines that are intersecting, um, some evidence of reassortment that's occurring in the field. And so that's led us to do some more uh, laboratory work and explore some of the, um, the potential for reassortment in the in vitro space. 
And so again, how field work can complement laboratory work is just uh, phenomenal. And Dr. Jennifer Kopenke uh, has just graduated and gone on to uh, Washington State. But what she's done in, in the laboratory is at least identified, if you see here, blue tongue virus two is represented in blue and, and 10 uh, different serotype represented in orange. But we do see with passage history and cell culture at the very least, we see contributions um, of both viruses and evidence of some reassortment. And so what I wanna get back to is the fact that reassortment is occurring. Um, I think there's definitely places where we can further explore and, and characterize some of the um, evolutionary processes of this virus. What I wanna leave with though, and this is um, obviously taken from um, this particular publication, but I think it highlights the importance of vector-borne disease and all the parameters that are contributing to changes. One of the things I'd like to highlight though, is not only climate change that's occurring potentially, but also climate variability. And it's not lost that all of these different um, projections of, of arrows are going, uh, contributing to each other and contributing to vector-borne disease. And I don't want to um, forget about the rest of these contributions, but I think these two potential uh, parameters, climate change and climate variability are going to be important things that we need to explore. Um, at, at this level. And so with that, just pulling it back to um, the impacts for Chilocoides transmitted diseases, I think we have to think about the virus with genetic diversity, um, emergence of virulent strains, the vector, um, obviously temperature has a, a huge uh, effect on different parameter estimates and different development rates uh, for, for even vector confidence of how this virus transmits. And then also the vertebrate um, as we're thinking about what habitat changes and health and well being could contribute as climate changes. And lastly, just bringing it back to the center, what effects are, these are just a few, but from humidity to climate variability and temperature, what is going to impact the changes in the dynamics of these culicoides transmitted diseases? So, with that, I just want to leave us with the larger message of blue tongue. You know, is it the, the point of the spear of 2006 and on of uh, an emerging arbovirus and climate change? What are we looking for the future and how are we gonna understand in, in incursions of this virus and potentially novel viruses due to evolution of the virus itself? And how will we explore understanding um, this? And so with that, I'd like to leave us with the, um, uh, all the contributions and acknowledgements of um, California and the work that we've done there, uh, the collaborations it's allowed to bring us to um, our new funding uh, through, through the Ecology and Evolution of Infectious Disease Program funded by NIFA. And we're supremely appreciative at Colorado State. This is our group. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how important a collaborative group has been. We also partner now with Notre Dame and their, their ecology group with some exquisite modelers and key ecologists. And then also just partners with um, some of our entomologist friends. Um, Emily has been a, a long-term friend from California that has helped me through some of this work. So without further ado, I will end my talk, but um, I would like to highlight another portion of what Dr. Bird has spoken about. No matter what pathogen you work on, collaboration and key partners are very important. Thank you, Christy, for the excellent talk. Um, also, I don't, I don't know if it's intentional, but I'd like to invite you to turn on your camera, if you like, for the question and answer portion. And um, I had a couple questions for you, and then I'll ask some questions that were presented by the audience as well. And, and the first, I'm really glad you emphasized the importance of field work and empirical data collection to support modeling efforts. I mean, so many times models are used and built on theoretical ideas, but um, when they're informed by actual field data, they're so much more powerful and robust. So really happy to see you doing that. My question for you is with the with changing climate, changing environment, is there any indication either through the viral genetics or the ecological studies you're doing that the blue tongue is expanding its host range, that it's starting to infect other um, domestic species that we haven't seen before? And the companion question to that is you're starting to see other vectors being able to spread blue tongue that perhaps um, beyond culicoides that, that we didn't expect. So to the best of my knowledge at this point, um, and we have a lot of key collaborators on, on the phone call today, um, 
you know, expanding beyond the vertebrate host range, you know, we're still, you know, culicoides feed on many things, um, you know, and if you think about the, the publications for Swedish, for instance, on horses, but not necessarily thinking about other host ranges as being part of the, the blue tongue um, cycle. The thing that I would think about is, um, you know, typically for blue tongue itself and transmission cycles and HTV, we're still thinking about that ruminant interface um, and things of that nature for the vertebrate side. Um, in cons consultation with Dr. McDermott before um, this particular uh, session, the in invertebrate would be something that I think we very well characterized uh, C. sonorensis and we studied it very well and that's the the colony that currently exists. What I would explore and what I would echo from Dr. McDermott is we maybe don't know a lot about the ecology and that probably is what's limiting us from other key species in North America um, and abroad, uh, even in the avaricious species. Um, some of those questions are still out there and I think they're needing to be explored um, in order for us to truly understand everything from larval habitat to how um, there could be potential transmission dynamics. And again, uh, kind of coming back to the, the European situation, I think identifying some of these, maybe they were already out there, but being able to truly identify some of these novel confident species was really important. And then I also just wanna highlight some of the key work from um, colleagues in Florida. Um, there's been a phenomenal work done uh, both in Georgia and Florida and looking at uh, species composition and what that distribution looks like. So really key groups are out there <laughs> exploring this work, but um, just kind of coming back to the fact that it's important to keep, you know, promoting that work and exploring all of the spaces in Culicoides, um, you know, and, and I often say <laughs> not not to stick just to the mosquitoes <laughs> um, in terms of a lot of mosquito work is done. And I think it's very important, obviously, but I think exploring some of these other vector species is also is critical um, for some of these animal pathogens. Pitch for uh, meaning a revitalization of medical entomology too, for more people to get interested in vectors. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. And it's fun because once people, it seems, get hooked to Culicoides, um, and I would love to see the faces of my colleagues right now, but once you get hooked to these little little bugs, you, for some reason, stick to it. Um, they're very intriguing to understand, and the and the vector host and pathogen interactions, um, and what constraints temperature is going to have on those. I think there are spaces that are going to be explored in those arenas that that are phenomenal, and I'll just leave it there. But great colleagues in in blue tongue. <laughs> Okay, hey, um, let me ask you some questions from participants. This is a, a technical question. What, um, this is from Aruna uh, Ambagala. What cells did you use to do the in vitro resortment experiment? Um, did you see the same rate of resortment in mammalian versus insect cells? So BHK, so um, baby hamster kidney cells we used. Um, this, the work that was done there, um, what we found with the Cuba cell work that we've ever done is that we are able, so with the reassortment work, um, it is acknowledged that in an in vitro system, it was a pretty relaxed system to allow for, for some of these potential reassortment events. Um, what we've identified, and we haven't done as much work on with insect cells um, that have been provided by the ARS um, at K-State, but what we haven't, what we find, I guess I could tell you, is that we isolate wild viruses, so viruses that we obtain samples from in the field, we can isolate viruses much more easily um, in the Cuba cells. But in that work, um, we are primarily focusing on, on just having it be a relaxed system. Um, in further work, we're trying to understand, you know, what other parameters, you know, in real life could have an effect on some of the reassortment events. So I hope that answered some questions. Yeah, and, and a follow-up to that from William Wilson. Um, are you seeing any particular segment preference for reassortment genome? Yeah, so overall, um, we we do find particular segments that 
that ten, right now we're probing that question a bit further. There are segments, I couldn't answer that with complete confidence. I would, um, I think we need to do more work before we particularly find segments we could rely on that are reassorting more frequently than others. But I want to come back to kind of the field component and what Dr. Justin Lee um, had done. Basically, in looking at that over history, what we'd found is that there's this unique backbone of a virus, um, kind of unique segments, typical segments that would come together. And then every now and then <laughs> adopt another segment, potentially segment two, which we're calling it, that's how we define the serotypes. But we're finding a predominant backbone of a virus that circulates, but conveniently every now and then we'll <laughs> take on another additional segment. And, and currently that's what we'd like to expand here in, in Colorado is kind of understanding more of those, those different dynamics and changes. And, um, and like I said, we have, <laughs> we have some work going on right now that hopefully we'll further explore some of those reassortment potential and dynamics, but um, stay tuned and <laughs> I guess a placeholder for our future work. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, listen, I want to thank you for a terrific presentation. We're going to move on to our next speaker, but we'll look forward to talking more about this in panel. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Mary Louise Penrith. Uh, she's an extraordinary professor in the Department of Veterinary Tropical Disease in the Faculty of Veterinary Science at the University of Pretoria, and she'll be discussing biosecurity, weapon for protecting pigs from African swine fever. Dr. Penrith. Thank, thank you very much. Ooh, where are we? Um, um, I'm going to keep my video off. Oh, well, all right. I'll start it, but I may have to put it off because my I'm a long way away from you and my connection isn't terribly stable. But um, and I'm not sure if that would help. But anyway, I'd, I'd like to. Uh, thank the um, organizers for inviting me here. And without further ado, I'll start trying to tell you something about how we feel that at the moment, biosecurity is practically the only weapon we have for protecting pigs from African swine fever. Um, am I on show here? Yes. Um, I'll have to give you a little bit of background about African swine fever because um, maybe some of you aren't very really familiar with it. It's a lethal viral hemorrhagic disease of pigs and it can cause up to 100% of the pigs that are affected to die. It was first described from East Africa in 1991. So in Africa, we have been living with this disease for more than 100 years. Um, it evolved in an ancient sylvatic cycle between warthogs, which are a peculiar looking African wild pig, and um, soft ticks or idus tampans of the Ornithodorus mabata complex in East and Southern Africa, not in the whole of Africa, just in East and Southern Africa. Um, they are highly pathogenic for any members of the genus Sus, which includes domestic pigs and Eurasian wild boars, which are actually the same species. They're simply an ancestral species. The disease remained confined to Eastern and Southern Africa until 1956, but it is now present in four out of the five continents, with only the Americas free, but anxious. You see the number of risk assessments coming out of it getting into America, there's a lot of concern. There's currently no effective vaccine or treatment available, so the prevention depends strictly on biosecurity. Um, I'm not going into it. It has a complex epidemiology that involves four cycles of transmission and maintenance. And uh, the warthog, the classical warthog sylvatic cycle, a cycle between domestic pigs and related ticks, and a wild boar environment cycle, which has been identified in Northern Europe since the disease got there in about 2014. And uh, the domestic pig cycle, which is present in Africa, in Europe, and in the Asia-Pacific region, is the only um, cycle of serious importance in most of the parts of the world where the disease occurs. 
The principles of biosecurity, and this is a picture of a farm in South Africa in the endemic area where you have the infected wolf hogs and they have these highly protected pink compartments to keep the disease out. Biosecurity measures are designed to create barriers between the pathogen and its target host to prevent transmission. And the, these are constructed based on the known epidemiology of the disease and the transmission risks present in the area where the pigs are farmed. So it should be risk-based. But biosecurity is not the system that's in place. The infrastructure, the biosecurity plan, and the code of practice, all of which have to be in place. But it's the day-to-day -day continuous implementation of the measures by everyone concerned with the pigs. So if there ever was a disease that required getting people on board, it's this one. The farms, the target farms that I'm concerned with are mainly the smaller farms because the modern intensive commercial pig farms usually have good biosecurity systems in place, but of course they do have to be fully implemented. And organic and other outdoor commercial pig production, uh, they're more exposed, obviously, but as long as the, um, the required uh, measures are in place, um, which is basically having a strong perimeter fence separating the pigs from any other animals that could get in, um, other pigs mainly, because the disease only affects pigs. It's not a zoonotic disease and it doesn't affect other livestock. And then we have the smallholder backyard and tr traditional pig production, which is a tremendous diversity from small commercial farms to backyard farms, perhaps run by one lady, and as in Mauritius on the left, or completely free ranging pigs that look after themselves and occasionally get collected to be eaten. Um, the, the only routes of transmission that I'm going to consider much here are without the ticks. Direct contact with infected pigs or pig carcasses, ingesting infected tissues or pork because the vi virus persists for a long time in a protein environment, or inhaling or ingesting infected material from contaminated objects such as equipment or footwear. And these are people being stopped from going into a pig farm and made to wash their hands and wipe their feet carefully with disinfectant before they go in because nobody wants the disease in their piggery. About 30% of the pigs globally are kept in these small farms, but in the lower income countries, like most of the countries in Africa, up to 90% of the pigs are kept in these small holder to free ranging farms. But they are very important for household income. As I say, it's not a zoonotic disease, but it's a very livelihood destroying disease if it gets into pig farms. These farms are at the highest risk of African swine fever because they have such low biosecurity. And the basic biosecurity measures that they need are very basic. Confine the pigs, feed safe food, restrict access to the pigs, stop fomites and infected objects from coming in through change of footwear, cleaning and disinfection of anything that comes into the piggery, and a clean water supply. But some of these things are considered a little bit beyond the means of these very small, poor farmers. So the challenges and the way forward, and we need to have a way forward because these small farms are by far the most represented in the African swine fever outbreaks that are occurring. And now that it's got into the Asia Pacific in the form of getting into a country like Papua New Guinea, to more or less, they are extremely poor countries where the people Pigs are the main livestock animal, and it's been a shock, I think, for everybody to see what a devastating effect it can have in such countries. So the challenges to implementation of biosecurity may be financial or socio-cultural. Financially, the cost of materials to confine the pigs to feed them, because once they've been in confined, they have to be fed, provision of water, cleaning, 
But also in some parts of Africa, at any rate, there's resistance of communities to the fencing of properties and access restrictions. They feel it's unneighborly, it's telling them we don't want you on our property and that's not Africa's way. So that becomes a problem if you want to keep your pigs safe. And what one has to do is to consult with the pig farmers to resolve these problems. You need in-depth consultations with the pig farmers themselves about what is feasible. What can you do? Could you do this? You say you can't do it. You can't do it because you find, can't find material to make a fence. Let's have a look and see what we have that you can get locally that's cheap or free. And what can we feed them? We can't buy commercial ration. It's not even available here. No, that's fine. We can find you other things that you can feed the pigs. We need to feed them leftover food, swill. That's fine. You just need to boil it for about 15 to 20 minutes and before you give it to the pigs and cool it down. Or in some of our areas, we could probably, after boiling it uh, for a shorter time, sun dry it because the sun is very... Um, inimical to the African swine fever virus. But you have to focus on what the pig keepers agree would be feasible. Because if you tell people to do something they can't do, they won't do it. And of course, we need to involve other stakeholders as necessary. Um, the the uh, local leaders and uh, possibly NGOs that, who can provide some support. And then Finally, the biosecurity along the pig value chain is extremely important, it's essential. And we have long and complicated pig value chains in the lower income countries sometimes. Many of the pigs are sold at live markets. They may be transported on the back of bicycles or in a very awkward way. They may be slaughtered in an abattoir, not, but by, not by any means always. They're much more likely slaughtered in the bush where there are no hygienic precautions and no meat inspection. And then they are sold in big retail markets, which actually the above, the one above is an excellent example of a beautifully clean um, pork market in a, a poor area in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, which is run by about 2000 ladies who make an income out of it. And it's very clean and nice to the very high end outlets also in Cote d'Ivoire where the wealthy population by delicatessen. But all along that chain, we need to have biosecurity in order to make sure that if African swine fever, an, an African swine fever infected pig has got into that value chain, it's stopped before its meat goes everywhere and anywhere where you can't trace it. So we are um, part of an FAO um, uh, expert group, which is trying to um, help with control of African swine fever. And we are saying we must have biosecurity, practical, affordable biosecurity at all levels of pig farming in order to have healthy pigs and better livelihoods for the people who keep them. Thank you. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Finished. Yes, no, <laughs> sorry, a, sorry, sorry, it's a little fast, but it's not a very technical talk. <laughs> no, thank you for that. It's actually a really important theme that I want to revisit in our panel discussion, and that is biosecurity, because it has it's important on so many levels, you know, not the least important being for protecting the animal health. And I wanted to ask you. Um, when, you, when, when you've seen discussions with smallholders about biosecurity, do the conversations broaden to beyond just African swine fever? Are there discussions about risks to human health of diseases that may get into a herd if there isn't biosecurity? Have you seen that integrated into the conversations? Uh, what we've seen is definitely they are interested way beyond African swine fever. They are saying, yes, but we don't have enough food to feed our pigs. That thin. What can we do? We, we see our pigs scratching themselves and the hair falls out. What do we do about that? I haven't particularly noted them asking about human diseases. 
but maybe people who've done more community work than I have would have heard that. But what they really need is a, what they're asking for is a holistic approach so that not only African swine fever, which may or may not come to them, is covered, but also the things that they're seeing day by day. And that is, uh, why, why do some of my piglets die? And that sort of thing. So uh, we are definitely looking at providing holistic information on pig production and pig health so that they can, and that would of course include any zoonotic diseases. In fact, some of our, the African swine, the African swine fever projects where I've been brought as an African swine fever expert were all about pig tapeworm actually. Mm. But because with pig tapeworm, they don't see anything in the pigs. They only, they see epilepsy in the people and they don't connect it to the pigs. Whereas African swine fever kills the pigs they're more likely to say, okay, I will confine the pigs, which will also help control the pig tapeworm because the pigs won't have access to human waste in that case. So yes, we, we are definitely looking at a very holistic approach. Now that's great. I mean, there's tremendous opportunity here and I think it's so important. Um, do you have particular uh, experiences where these conversations have been successful in changing attitudes about confinement to the pigs or cordoning off small pig herds? What do you find has worked the best? We have had some successes. I was involved in a project in Mozambique when I was living there, where we had a 15 month project. One of the gentlemen at the beginning of the project said, oh, I just want new pig size. I don't want the project to tell me what to do with my pigs. I know what to do, but I want new pig size. And we went, and our team went and had a look at his pig stars and one of them burst out laughing and said, I don't wonder that you want new pig stars. You've got the most awful pig stars I've ever seen. And they were sort of balanced pieces of corrugated iron. And uh, what we did was we went in and treated parasites and, uh, you know, did a survey and then treated parasites. And at the end of the project, we had a, and gave them a lot of information through workshops, posters, pamphlets, everything. They had an African swine fever outbreak as well, which helped because we helped them to manage to avoid that, some of our farmers. And at the end of the project, this man got up and he said, I'd like you to come and visit me. I have new pig stars. And he certainly did. He had practically, practically a palace laid out there with, his, with, a, with imported pig stock from South Africa. So sometimes it's, but when we, they were people near the city of Maputo who had a market. We had another site up in the north in a remote area. And the people said, we believe everything that you've taught us. But unfortunately, whatever we do, our neighbors to whom we sell our pigs will not pay more for them. So we can't really invest in, in it. So it's very variable. And that is something that we have to take into consideration. And it's really beyond the power of the vets to solve. But we do feel we can work on authorities to try to improve access to better markets for these people, just by a bit of improved infrastructure or by setting up local facilities or by letting them move their pork to somewhere, their healthy pork to somewhere where it can be sold for more money. And oftentimes the health issues can be solved with economic benefits, you know, showing advantage yeah. economically to improving that. Um, you know, this is good. So we've spoke, spoken a lot about the African context, but have you had experiences? There's a question here from Margaret Allen. It's a good one. There's a, a big epidemic going on in Asia, particularly China and through Southeast Asia. And can you yeah. speak to the situation there and whether approaches have been different in terms of trying to contain this virus as it's spreading? Yeah. I've only got remote experience there because uh, um, it arrived in, in China in uh, August 2018. It spread to a number of countries elsewhere by, 20, by sort of the middle of 2019. And, um, and then, of course, in 2020, COVID arrived and I would possibly have gone to Papua New Guinea, but um, I'm involved remotely in helping them with the African swine fever. But in, in Asia, it's, it's, for instance, I've heard and I know within the group a lot about Vietnam, which is a pig rich country and a pig dense country. It also has a lot of small farmers and it's been very bad there because it transmits very quickly because it's, well, 
as quickly as African swine fever does transmit, which is not very, very quickly, but it does transmit from one farm to another. They have neighbors who share equipment and who visit each other and look at each other's pigs and so on. And what they have been trying to do is to, the main thing in Asia and in Papua New Guinea is to try to avoid at all costs massive culling, which is what is the conventional thing, kill all the pigs and you'll be fine. Well, you can't get rid of all those pigs, you don't know where to put them. And in fact, Vietnam is reprocessing them into animal feed. And they are trying to do something that was started in China because it actually can move quite slowly through a pig barn, for instance. You have a couple of pigs die and they test positive. So you test the other pigs in that pen and any that are positive, you will kill them and you'll observe the others and you'll test others in other pens and they're not infected yet. And you conserve those pigs. You do not kill them because you don't have to kill them as long as you can keep controlling the infection. And that's something I really like about the Asian approach. And it's something that we are trying very hard to do in Africa as well, because we really can't afford to waste all that pork. And, and that pork. relies on the availability of diagnostics to help guide those decisions as to whether pigs are or aren't infected. Definitely. And the biggest problem that we have there is that although we do have some rapid tests for the virus, they're not as reliable as, as, as laboratory tests. So you might get false negatives and they need to go to a laboratory. And that's been much easier in Asia than it would be in Africa because it's more dense, more compact, and there's better infrastructure for getting things around. And yes, but we do have some, some rapid diagnostics. And um, the other thing is that it's quite expensive. So we do quite a lot of um, uh, waiting for the clinical signs rather than having to do PCRs all the time because it's very expensive. And clearly the people who own the pigs can't pay, but the pork producer organization has been wonderful in supporting this kind of effort in our country. But most of the countries in Africa don't even have that. Given the fact that there's involvement with wild boar and a kind of sylvatic host, is this a disease that could be controlled with vaccination if there were a vaccine available? It's a very good question because, well, our, our so-called our wild pigs, they're not wild boars, they're, they're wild, we call them wild suets because they're, they're pig-like, they're part of the suet family, but they diverged about nine million years ago, and they themselves are not uh, transmitters directly of African swine fever virus. You need the ticks for the warthogs to transmit and bush pigs in a laboratory, they can transmit it directly rather inefficiently if you make them acutely affected. So they're really not a factor in that sense. It's They are a factor in that the ticks will, will transmit from the warthogs. Uh, with a vaccine, possibly, but what we have, because we are in the in Eastern and Southern Africa. If we had a virus for the type, uh, genotype one virus that's widespread in West Africa, where the there is no, um, and Cameroon countries like that, where there's no sylvatic cycle, it would be very possible to control with a vaccine, provided the quick turnover of pigs and the poverty of the people didn't make it impossible. But given that you could do it efficiently, but we have 24 genotypes in our area. And there has been the limited work that's been done is that there isn't cross protection between all of them. So we might need more than one virus. We might need more than two viruses. Uh, the Russians did work uh, in the 70s on uh, some of the African viruses as well as um, the genotype one that was in Europe then. And I, they, they found seven serotypes, which might be more informative, but that's still a lot of serotypes. And particularly if there wasn't much cross protection, you might need three or four viruses. And that's more difficult. On the other hand, there are only about five of the 24 genotypes that have actually become pig adapted, as far as we can see. And if we had viruses against those, we might need three against those, minimum of three. But um, it would be more feasible than having 
twenty four. <laughs> but uh, um, I, as I see it, it's going to be more a question of poverty and the, the numbers and the low, generally rather low value of pigs. Vaccination was terrific for rinderpest because cattle are so highly valued. But pigs, they're not going to find it so easy with PPR because they're little little creatures, the goats, they don't have a very high value initially. So, you know, they're individually valuable when you want to pay the child school fees, but um, they're not, in the greater scheme of things, high value. So, yeah. yeah. I think biosecurity will be with us even long after we get a vaccine. Yeah, to be yeah. With sounds like a comp, comp, vaccines could be complicated for this one. Um, I want to bring in a question from Vivian O'Donnell, who wanted to ask you about, and, and this goes along with the value of pigs. Uh -huh. Could you expand a little bit on um, small farmers, and I think in the African context, in terms of the government's ability to decontaminate and repopulate farms if there has to be a culling or stamping out? Are the, is there enough resource or mechanism? Do we see uh, government resupplying pigs if, if you have to cull? You don't see them depopulating in the first place usually. Even my country, which although its, it's economy is in collapse, is still considered an upper middle income country. There is a law. Absolutely, it's in our law now. They are not going to compensate for any pigs, so they're not going to cull any pigs. The owners of, of better farms are told to cull their pigs voluntarily if they want to, but <laughs> they won't get any money for it. And as for restocking, no. <laughs> the only thing, mechanism we have in, in our country is uh, the pork producer organization has been paying what they call goodwill payments. It's not market related, but some of the countries cull in, in Cote d'Ivoire, they cull, they've still been culling because they don't have it, it endemically just yet. I think they're, they're busy making it endemic. Um, they cull the pigs all in a 10 kilometer radius, whether they're alive, healthy, sick, dead, Bias, highly biosecure farm, they cull a lot. And then they pay the people one third market price. You can imagine how pigs move when they're going to cull, when the government's going to cull. So the disease spreads like wildfire <laughs> because it's just not enough. So no, the situation in Africa about depop, repop is, it's just not there. Thank you. Um, and last question, just uh, looking for a, a piece of hope on this virus, but this is from Kate Schumann. Um, do you think we'll get to a point where we can, can eradicate ASF given the, the sylvatic cycle and the resources we have? Could we get to that point? We can eradicate it in domestic pigs, I do believe. We will never eradicate the infection in warthogs and, and bush pigs because we won't allow you to. They're very precious. We have nature conservation. And they're very precious wild animals. So we won't allow that eradication to happen. But it's not rocket science to keep warthogs and, and domestic pigs apart. So yes, we could eradicate it in domestic pigs. It, not perhaps very quickly, but we could. And thanks, well, thank Kate. you. For, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Penrith. Really Georgia. Uh, a great presentation, and um, there's much more to talk about in line with biosecurity when we get to panel. So thank you very much, and we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, thank you. Our fourth, our fourth speaker is Dr. Desiree Lavode, who's a physician scientist and epidemiologist and professor in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stanford University School of Medicine. And this will be a discussion of animal sourced food practices and the risks for potential urban Rift Valley fever virus exposure. Dr. Lebode. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me and letting me be part of this wonderful panel. Today, I would like to discuss our work on animal sourced food practices, as you just mentioned, and really what are the risks around food and Rift Valley fever virus, and what is the potential for urban transmission where we work in Kenya? As many of you on this great webinar know, Rifeli fever is a zoonotic flubovirus endemic in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, as depicted here in the CDC map. And it emerged in Kenya in the 1930s, um, and then you know has led to lots of outbreaks, some detected, some not, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in 2000, it, it jumped to the Middle East for the first time emerging off of the African continent. 
the last major outbreak was actually in Mayotte, which is right here. Yeah, um, in 2019 and in, in 2018, Kenya had had an outbreak. We know that rift causes a, a lot of problems in both human and animal populations. Um, in animals, it can lead to sick animals, aborting animals, young dying animals, and can be spread among animal populations. And then in humans, it significantly causes a lot of, of human disease. Some humans can be asymptomatic. Most have a mild symptomatic febrile illness. And then some unfortunate folks end up with severe disease. And this can lead to ocular scarring and actual loss of vision in a good percentage of people. And then hemorrhagic fever, meningoencephalitis, hepatitis, and other organ failure in other folks. And when people get severe disease, about half of them succumb to Rifelli fever virus infection. So the transmission cycle of rift is complex and usually begins when there's heavy rainfall, either heavy seasonal rains or um, extreme weather events, El Nino events in the east, La Nina events in West Africa, leading to a lot of, of flooding. And laying at the, the shallow depressions in the landscape here are these infected mosquito eggs, usually floodwater 80s, which are transalibarily infected, already have virus. And so you get a huge bloom of these, these vectors and they go and um, feed on ruminant hosts, amplifying hosts that get very sick with the infection and have high viremias and so forth. Um, also, later on, you know, other mosquito species can also transmit rift. Um, these species are important for biting humans oftentimes. Um, directly uh, through that bite of the infected, you know, Culex bite or other Aedes bites. And then these other species also um, infect wild vertebrate hosts. And we're unsure how important these wild vertebrate hosts are to maintenance of the virus um, in the natural environment. But humans definitely get infected directly from their animals. And this can happen in, in many different ways. Um, some populations, uh, like semi nomadic pastoralists um, working in um, living in, in East Africa, where I work, um, for instance, and in, in northeastern Kenya, um, you know, they have very direct contact with their animals. It's really part of, of their livelihood and, and the way they live. And so contact can happen that way. Um, in other places, perhaps in urban places, which is where I'm talking about today, people might not own these livestock, but there's livestock around. And again, they're having direct contact with their livestock um, and can get infected that way. There's occupational risks. We know that herders, abattoir workers, um, even vets, of course, are at higher risk for, for getting rift directly because they have a lot of different animal contacts through slaughter um, of animals and so forth. And then there are the, the foods that we get from our animals, right? The milk and the meat, and those can have their risks. And then finally, there are certain cultural practices that might put you in contact with infected animal secretions, um, and that can, can be a risk. So today I'm gonna focus mainly on um, animal sourced food products and, and potential risk for Rifelli fever virus exposure. So Rift um, is a, um, and a very important infection. Uh, it's my favorite virus. It is a very interesting virus to study um, and it is, is definitely uh, on top lists. Um, people are watching this virus because there is a great potential for emergence. We know that rift can be spread by many, many different vector species. There are many, many vectors that are competent for this virus, which extends where transmission might be able to happen in the world. I've already mentioned people get it rift from, you know, dealing with sick animals. Um, and there's also vertical transmission in the vector, in animals, and in humans that have been proven. Um, that jump off of the African continent in 2000 to the Middle East was likely due to spread of animals. So of course, if you have a sick animal with a lot of virus and you move that animal, there's always a potential for that to be um, an index case for, for a new outbreak, and that has happened. And we know that humans can also transport rift. Um, so there have been recent cases from Angola to China where humans have and, you know, led to imported cases of rift. And this has happened in many countries of the world. Um, and that's important because humans do get very high viremias with rift and might in fact be able to be that index case for, for transmission. Um, there are many areas in Kenya where I work that are deemed high risk areas because the people there really are have intimate contact with their livestock and really that the, you know that livestock interaction really supports their livelihoods and we know of many many different human risk factors for rift and this includes herding and slaughtering of livestock assisting in animal birth sheltering livestock and even meat preparation and consuming raw milk um, there have been studies that have actually shown that consuming sick animals during outbreaks is associated with death and more severe disease. Um, this most recently happened in the 2018 Kenya outbreak. 
Um, and as I mentioned, there is this occupational risk to butchers, veterinarians, and herders. And so we know a lot about the epidemiology of risk, and we know about some of the human risk factors, but there hasn't been that much field data on the infectious nature of foods, of meat and milk. But we know that milk could actually have a significant influence on Rift Valley fever exposure. And this would expand opportunities for non-vector-borne transmission cycles. So a better understanding of the differential risks associated with animal products like meat and milk um, from various species is really necessary to really describe the transmission cycle for Rift and then prevent this, prevent it from spreading in local areas and prepare ourselves worldwide for you know, what this would mean if Rift ended up spreading to new areas. What do food products, you know, how risky are they? Milk also might impact emergence into naive populations. Um, I am a pediatrician, I care a lot about kids. We've had studies in the past that we've shown that kids you know, may end up be getting rift exposure from milk ingestion. And so again, there's this um, risk for local communities, but also a risk of importation via trade without really a regulation of these milk products. And then again, in Northeast um, Kenya where I work, People there really believe that RIF comes from mosquitoes mainly, um, and that, and perhaps interaction with sick animals, but not really from animal products. And so there's a lot to do here with education and really understanding this potential risk more. Our epidemiology studies have shown that um, the odds of rift um, exposure, so rift valley fever. Um, seropositivity is definitely higher in those who ingest raw milk, so 20 times higher, and this varies by different animal species. Um, and also, milking also is at risk, right? So six times the odds of being rift positive if you milk any animals. And so um, we know that these foods, at least epidemiology-wise, epidemiologically, that there may be risks, but we don't know truly what that is. And so we wanted to dig a little deeper and try and understand, you know, food source project, um, food sourced um, product risk with rift. And interestingly, we really wanted to do it in an urban area. So we know a lot about rift in rural areas, as I mentioned, but we don't know that much about rift potential in urban areas. And we know that by 2050, 70% of the population is going to live in urban areas. And in urban areas, there's this increased demand for animal source foods. Of course, more people mean we need more food, right? And there's massive inequalities in urban areas and small geographical regions. And so what that means is that there might be heterogeneous risk for rift in urban areas. Our work and others has shown um, diverse habitats for mosquito breeding in urban areas. Um, we find in our studies more, more 80 species in urban areas and rural areas and more mosquitoes if there are livestock around. And there are livestock in these urban areas. We know also that urban centers have these large tertiary animal markets with animals entering from many different regions or even countries. And so they could be bringing rift with them perhaps. And so this is important to understand. It's important to understand the flow during these different value chains in meat and milk. And then finally, meat processing can differ, right? Sometimes when people move to the, to the urban areas from rural areas, they bring their upcountry practices with them. So they may have some of the same risks that we've identified in rural areas and these urban areas, but also in urban areas, there are different meat processing um, ways. And so these high density facilities may actually, you know, sort of narrow risk in certain areas. And so it's important to understand. So our study, uh, we had a community-based cohort in Kenya um, where we have about 2,700 people. And we're working in two areas of Kenya. We're working in Western Kenya, um, in Kisumu, which is a large urban center, and then on the South coast of Kenya um, in Akunda. And so we, we tested everybody for Rift Valley Fever IgG and found about a 1% overall seroprevalence in our entire cohort. And we actually found a little bit more, about 2% of people positive in Kisumu, about 1% in Akunda. And this is interesting because there have been risk maps that have been done showing that the west side is actually low risk and the coast is more high risk. But I think that's changing. Rift is emerging in new places. And this 2018 outbreak actually happened in Western Kenya near CIA. And so um, definitely Western Kenya is also at risk now. So we followed up with our cohort, um, about 1,500 of them, and asked them specific animal exposure questions to try and get an understanding of what the, the animal contacts and animal and, and Rift Valley fever risk factors might be in an urban area. And then we did a small nested case control study where it was a mixed method study um, with um, 84 controls and 21 cases that included both adults and children to get more detailed information, more qualitative information really on, on what people are doing with their food, what their food practices are, and trying to understand you know, potential risk for Rift Valley fever exposure. 
So in that greater cohort of 2,700 people, when we looked at those who were seropositive, um, as usual, we found males were more likely to be seropositive and older individuals, of course, were more likely to be seropositive. And as I mentioned, there was a trend towards those in Western Kenya um, being more likely to be seropositive. And um, we did not find any, um, any exposure uh, linked to education. And when we followed up with them to try and understand their sort of risk factors or animal contact in the urban setting, overall, we found very low animal ownership cohort compared ownership in our cohort compared to what we'd normally see in a Western area. And um, so uh, the great majority of people, almost 80% don't own animals, but there are a few owners of animals. However, there are a lot of animals around in these urban areas. There's higher rates of seeing animals around the home for seropositive participants, particularly goats. And we know goats, of course, are a species that are highly susceptible to Rift Valley fever virus infection. Uh, there is a trend that, you know, seropositive folks are, are getting bitten by mosquitoes daily. And we did find um, significant risks compared um, when we looked at milk, right? So seropositive participants were more likely to consume raw milk and not boiling milk was significantly associated with Rift Valley fever virus exposure. And this is interesting here because finally, we're working with a population where we can kind of distinguish all of these animal exposures. Oftentimes in rural areas, people have all the exposures, you know, they're slaughtering, they're butchering, they're drinking milk, they're milking animals and so forth. But now in the urban areas, most people don't actually own animals. And so we might be able to really hone down on, on food related risks for Rift Valley fever virus in this community. In our small case control study, again, we did a semi-structured questionnaire and used qualitative methods to really understand what, you know, what people are doing with their food and, and, and how much they know about Rift Valley fever virus. And um, even the participants, um, when we told them that they were definitely exposed to Rift, many of them had not heard of that. They didn't know they were Rift exposed and none of them knew that if they had ever been tested before, they thought not. Um, although a lot of people don't own animals, they end up touching a lot of animals. And there was a trend there that, you know, people who touched animals were more likely to be exposed. And many people still own animals in their upcountry homes. And so, you know, it may still be slightly difficult in some circumstances to really, again, um, kind of separate all of these animal related risks when people might be traveling from the urban areas back to their upcountry homes and, and dealing with animals there and might see, you know, get their risk there. So 98% of people um, in, in our cohort um, in the small case control study consume beef. And interestingly, in the urban areas, you know, they get it from the butchery. However, with goats, a lot of people consume goat, but they're more likely to do the slaughtering themselves, again, potentially putting them at risk um, for those slaughtering risk factors, even in the urban areas. Um, we had a few people who admitted to tasting beef before cooking, and both of them were seropositive. And importantly, um, at least a fifth of people said that they thought people in the area would definitely consume a sick animal and sell it on the market, even if they knew it was sick, because it's part of their livelihood. And so, you know, this is important. And again, you know, movement of sick animals during outbreaks has been linked, especially in the 2018 Kenya outbreak, to, to um, illness among people. Now, what about milk? Well, um, compared to our rural areas, more people are boiling milk. So 92% of our cohort is boiling their milk. Um, and not boiling milk, again, significantly associated with Rift Valley fever exposure. But it's important to note that safe dairy practices really extend just beyond boiling milk. Um, in these urban areas, there's a lot of different sources of milk. You know, people uh, get the milk from the store. They can get the milk from dairy cow owners. They can get milk from milk vendors um, you know, and so forth. And so um, there was an, an association between um, people who had unofficial milk sources and being and being seropositive for rift in the small study, there was a trend. Um, and also, um, we found some just with the qualitative work, we found some new potential risks. So oftentimes, um, people add separated milk to cooked vegetables right before eating. And so this may be important and an, an important risk. And there's also a lot of consumption of of yogurt, homemade yogurt. And we know that milk's not boiled before making the yogurt. And in this small study, we didn't see a difference between cases and controls for consuming homemade yogurt, but it still might be a risk. Also the milk vendors themselves, because they're coming in contact with milk from a lot of different places, they probably are also at, maybe at risk for Rift Valley fever virus exposure themselves, just like maybe veterinarians or butchers might be. Um, and people don't know how to recognize their abnormal dairy milk. And again, this may be important for rift exposure and maybe potential other human pathogen exposures. And then other than meat and milk, um, there are other products uh, that have animal, um, you know, potentially animal fluids that, that are important. So 
Um, there was a, a trend towards people that consumed animal blood more likely to have Rift Valley fever exposure. You know, there's a lot of sausage that's made and so forth. There's also cultural practices that people bring with them to their urban areas um, from, you know, from their countryside homes like the Maasai. And so they may imbibe cattle blood and so forth. And this could put them at risk. Um, we didn't find any um, use for animal fat or any other animal products, except we did find this new um, this new potential risk for Rift where people add raw bile onto roasted meat. Um, and again, I don't know uh, if raw bile could be infectious for Rift and if that's an important thing to further, um, to, to further work up. So our next steps here are to really continue our focus groups with these high risk groups. We're gonna meet with butchers and livestock owners and veterinarian and paraprofessionals and, and milk vendors to understand awareness and risks. Um, we're, we really want to understand infectious nature of meat and milk and bile and blood and other animal products, um, how they can be safely handled, you know, what consumption practices are like, really understand the entire milk value chain, including yogurt. We don't know if, if this is, you know, if Rift can survive in yogurt with the different pH fluctuations and all of that. Um, we're, we want to get detection um, in the hands of people who, who um, are, are close to where the risk is, just so we can stop it quickly. Um, you know, there may be potential for physical characteristics to be identified um, with rift. And so the butchers could maybe stop, um, you know, these, the, the outbreaks before they really move on. Um, and then we really want to work with folks who are doing, you know, viral isolation studies in their BSL-3 and BSL-4 um, labs so that we can really characterize whether or not meat and milk and bile um, are infectious and have a lot of infectious virus in them and whether, you know, this is really an important thing to focus on when we talk about transmission and maintenance of rift in natural environments and also emergence and spread in, in new areas. And then finally, we find um, a lot of areas here for, for improved surveillance and improved community engagement and improved education among community members because butchers may be able to recognize lesions, you know, and, um, you know, milk vendors may be able to, you know, decrease their risk by getting milk from certain places. And so we really want to educate the community, bring them up, um, um, when it comes to, to really protecting themselves and their community members against this virus. So I'd like to thank uh, Kelly, who is uh, a veterinary, a veterinarian who has been my postdoc in this work and has led many, uh, much of what I've said today. Um, my team leads in, in Kenya, uh, Dr. Bryson and Denga from Kemri, and then um, Francis Matuku from the Technical University of Mombasa, our, our field team in Kenya, uh, the Sanford team that did a lot of the ELISA testing and data analysis, and then our funders. Kelly's funded by a GHES scholarship program, which is ending in a few months. We're looking for more funding for her so she can continue this work on, on food source for, um, um, risk for RIFT, and then our R01, which supports the larger field study in Kenya. Thank you very much. Thank you for a terrific talk, Dr. Laveau. And I really like that, you know, it highlights the importance of using epidemiology to understand additional routes of transmission for viruses beyond the, the most prevalent ones necessarily. So exploring this question of foodborne transmission is very important. I wanna start with a question that I think is challenging for any of studies looking at exposure to viruses um, as opposed to infection. And that is, you know, we often see antibodies against zoonotic viruses like filoviruses or henipoviruses in hunting communities that hunt wildlife that have exposure to and eat animals thought to be reservoirs for viruses. Do you have a sense from your work whether there is a, an underlying um, low level exposure or immunity conferred or in communities that are eating meat and animal products or that there's any difference in exposure between consumption versus mosquito-borne transmission? And what have your observations been there in terms of disease incidence? Yeah, so I don't think we know, right? And it's like you say, John, it's really hard to distinguish. Um, we've definitely, uh, over the years working in Kenya, have seen a lot of intra-epidemic transmission, right? So we, you know, we follow communities and then we see that they're being exposed. And this is without, of course, any sort of large detected outbreaks going on. Um, and so whether or not people are getting exposed in between outbreaks, you know, by food sourced products or vector or maybe low level animal transmission that isn't, you know, causing huge abortion storms or, or huge outbreaks that are coming to, you know, attention, it's difficult to say, right? Um, I think that, um, I, I just think, you know, I think the, the point, and I want to bring up what Brian and others have said, I mean, I loved the talks today and I feel like, you know, there's so, so many commonalities here, but, um, I, you know, we need really longitudinal sort of 
one health approaches where we study the humans and the animals and the vectors and we follow people over long periods of time to really find that like fine scale transmission and try and identify you know is it in between outbreaks vector exposure you know how much of outbreak um, disease in humans is actually related to direct animal contact and I think working in, in urban populations is important because there are a lot of people on ur in the urban world right if, even though the percentage is small there's still people getting exposed there. And so figuring out exactly how that's happening is just important for preparedness, right? For other urban areas, so. Yeah, and to your point about longitudinal studies, um, from what I understand about RIFT, there are um, climate-related uh, boom cycles of Rift Valley that, that follow rainfall, periods of rainfall. Uh, and so do you think that that also correlates with exposure levels? And would that, how would you think about that in terms of potential interventions or warnings about meat and animal product consumption, knowing that there may be a higher incidence going on because of uh, more transmission? I mean, yeah, so I think um, linkage with whatever data we have in order to prepare, prepare, like prepare ourselves and sort of prevent transmission is important. So we do know, of course, there have been incredible climate connections with Rift Valley fever virus, right, and, and flooding as far as initiation of outbreaks um, and large scale outbreaks. And so um, using that climate data to try and prepare ourselves for outbreaks is really important, especially with enough lead time to get um, hopefully human vaccine, which I hope is coming, animal vaccination up and going um, and, and continued in, in at-risk communities is really important. I think that, um, that uh, you know, because there is um, transmission happening, you know, outside of those, of those large sort of climate connected um, um, sort of outbreaks. I think it's important to keep surveillance going the whole time. And, you know, the climate, it's different in different parts of the world, right? Like El Nino, I work in East Africa, right? So El Nino means a lot of rain, right? Well, not so much in West Africa, right? It's more La Nina that, that leads to outbreaks and so forth. I think that, um, I think preparedness is going to take a, a lot of, of, of taking all of these different types of information and, and bringing them together. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, one last question for me, and then we'll get to participant questions. You talked about um, travel, movement of animals, movement of humans as a potential way to introduce this virus. Do you expect to see um, the establishment of rift in new geographies from what you're seeing about its expansion and range right now? Yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yes, I think so. Um, so uh, again, rift can be spread by a lot of different vectors. It can also hide, right? Like I'm telling you, like even in places with good surveillance, you know, like East Africa and West Africa, it still hides, right? You can, you still miss outbreaks, you miss transmission. And the problem with rift is that um, it can hide like that and cause like little outbreaks and low level transmission until it's, it can't really be stopped, right? You can imagine if Rift were to come to the US, it would completely an, a, a, like obliterate our, our livestock industries, right? $3 billion, um, we would, our animals would be highly susceptible. Many of those animals would die. It would cause major problems um, with our economics. Um, and I think lately we've been seeing Rift being introduced into lots of different areas, right? Like the, that whole Angola to China recently was really interesting, right? Again, there are so many vectors in different parts of the world that might be able to transmit rift. It is a risk, right? And so again, this is why we really need good surveillance and, and everyone's sort of working together to understand what all of the different risks are. Excellent, thank you. Well, here's a technical question from Tang Truong, which was about the um, serology that you did and what kind of ELISA were you using? What kind of diagnostic tests were you using to establish antibodies in people in your studies? Yeah, so we actually use an ELISA based on MP12, which is, um, which is a, a human vaccine for Rift. It's a live attenuated virus that can be used at, at BSL2. And so we have an ELISA that we've been using for many years. And then and then uh, there are PRNTs that are done to confirm positive cases. Thank you. And a question from Vivian O'Donnell about vaccination programs. Uh, are there vaccine vaccines that exist for um, for humans, for animals? Are there programs in place? What what's the trajectory on that for this disease? Yeah. So there are um, animal vaccines. There's no a widely available human vaccine at the current time. Although Cepi, 
um, which is a coalition for, um, right, oh man, I'm not gonna know exactly what CEPI stands for, but CEPI. Yeah. Um, um, CEPI is funding um, human vaccine work in Rift. Um, there's also a lot of um, really wonderful animal vaccines that are up and coming, improved animal vaccines. Um, there is sometimes a disincentive uh, because, uh, so Rift, when you, when you know Rift is circulating in, in animal populations, OIE will place a three-year export ban on your animals, which is devastating economically to endemic countries. And so there is a lot of disincentive to report any type of rich transmission across the world, right? That's why OIE data is fairly flawed because we're just getting the tip of the iceberg. Um, however, with improved animal vaccines, and you know, people are, are uh, figuring out how to, how to be able to tell natural infection from vaccinated animals, DIVA. And so um, with these new animal vaccines that are maybe safer and, and better, I think that there will be more animal uptake. I know Brian has worked a lot on, uh, on animal vaccine for Rift, and it's definitely a crucial part of obliterating transmission and, and stopping things before they hurt the animals and also hurt, hurt the humans. Um, and then I said, as I said, there are human vaccine trials going on. Hopefully CEPI will continue to fund human vaccine work on Rift. I think we need, again, a one, one health approach where we integrate a lot of community education, um, really detection and surveillance on the ground, integrated networks, and then um, human and animal vaccine in order to prevent this and then prepare ourselves for for introduction into rift and i just want to say one thing i know we have to end but we did do right. work I, I i i was part of a team with um andrew golnar and and gabe hamer and rebecca keating and mike Terrell, and we we did a study on how is rift going to spread across the world like what is the highest risk for for rift emergence in new areas and it really was the movement of people which we're seeing that in Angola to China. So imported cases, because humans do get high enough pyremias to maybe be the index case in new regions where vectors exist and, and animal reservoirs exist, but then also movement of animals, right? And so, um, and, and animal movement, as, as was just spoken by Dr. Penworth, people move their animals around, especially when they're getting sick. So this is true. Yes. And we've seen lots of examples of epidemics that are driven by animal movement um, as well as human movement. So great point. And, and looking forward to continuing this in panel. Thank you so much for a great talk and good discussion. Um, we're going to pause now, and I think we're going to take a break um, before we go into panel. I believe we have um, a 15 minute break. And we'll resume at 1115. Um, where we come back into panel. So I want to thank all of our speakers for terrific talks and look forward to the discussion in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. We're going to begin our panel discussion. And I'll ask the speakers all to turn on their cameras. And I want to just start again by thanking our speakers for really terrific talks and I'm looking forward to this discussion. So thank you to Dr. Bird, Dr. Mayo, Dr. Penrith and Dr. LeBeau. And I want to start our discussion around the theme or the, the topic of human use of animal protein. I mean, we've talked about a variety of different diseases, some strictly animal, some zoonotic, but I think that an important underlying theme that we need to think about in the scientific community as health practitioners, as one health practitioners, is really how we're going to deal with the fact or how we're gonna balance the fact that we have a growing human population an increasing demand for animal protein that comes with it. And we now know the science is advanced enough that we understand that there are really direct linkages and robust linkages between things like bushmeat hunting, wildlife trade, livestock production, all of these as risk factors and drivers for zoonotic pathogen spillover for disease transmission within animals and from animals to people, okay, whether they're veterinary diseases or zoonotic diseases. And we talked earlier, we spoke earlier in Dr. Penrith's talk about the importance of biosecurity. And there's, there's a lot of ways to approach and think about this, these sometimes competing interests, the need for animal protein, but the risks associated with uh, human disease emergence or veterinary disease emergence. So I wanna ask the group, how do, we, how do we balance this? How do we go forward with development in different societies under different cultural contexts, knowing what we know, being in the midst of a global pandemic of a zoonotic virus, where do we need to focus our efforts scientifically in the public health arena, in the veterinary and human health sector to, to make the biggest impact in terms of protecting human animal health in the face of these growing demands? And Brian, let me start with you. You know, what are the approaches that we need to, to really deal with this, this issue? Hmm. Well, that's a very, very thought provoking question, John. I like it very much. Um, you know, I, in my mind, I think it starts with the recognition, yes, that the human population is growing, uh, well, somewhat exponentially, but, uh, and that our need for animal protein is pushing our need for land and incursions into previously wild spaces. Uh, although you can make the argument there are no wild spaces left on the planet anymore, right? But the, the use of, uh, you know, secondary forests and even primary forests for food production or oil production in particular. I know, John, you're very extensively involved in that work in Southeast Asia with palm oil plantations and the right. like. Uh, recognizing that that is a driver of virus spillover and emergence of novel viruses, you know, like I'm perhaps like uh, SARS-2 coronavirus or others. Uh, you know, the recognition of that and understanding that it's really through awareness is our only chance of changing that paradigm and then trying to build a, a separation like Dr. Penrith was talking about much, much more extensively in her talk of how do you separate contact of wild animals from domesticated production animals uh, through infrastructure or other biosecurity measures. So I'll leave it there and turn it over to others. Yeah, and so Dr. Penrith, is it gonna be biosecurity primarily? Is it vaccine development, therapeutics for people and animals? What is, what's gonna give us the, the most bang for our buck in terms of resources for preventing disease emergence? Probably a combination of all those things depending on, on the disease in question. Hmm. Um, but I think that I think that biosecurity itself will remain um, one of the, our major weapons against the spread of disease from animals to humans, from humans to animals, from animals to animals, along value chains in farming systems. And I think it's extremely important for human health to um, prevent disease in animals to the greatest possible extent. And for me, prevention is always better than cure. So yes, vaccines, probably over therapeutics. Although, you know, with humans, I think therapeutics in particular 
uh, it's good to have them because people will get the diseases. But I think the, to the greatest possible extent, in men, uh, investing in whatever under the circumstances is going to give the best, be the best preventive measure is important. My one reservation about vaccinations is that if people see them as a silver bullet that absolutely gives full protection and you can forget about the biosecurity, eat whatever you like, do whatever you like, sell it wherever you like, I don't think it's going to work because I don't think any vaccine is that good. And I think that you have to have that combination of of education and care, people doing the right things, as well as having tools like vaccines. I think we've I think we're seeing with COVID the challenge of finding the right pitch in messaging vaccines to the public, right? I mean, you want to present them as a really important tool for infection control, but you have to describe their limitations. And sometimes that gets into a nuance that's hard to appreciate. So that, that's a, a tricky tightrope. Um, what about, Dr. Lebeau, what about changing people's dietary habits? I mean, how hard is that going to be? Is that part of the approach we need to take in terms of mitigating disease transmission? Well, what I was going to say to your question is, um, yeah, I think, as other speakers have said, we have to take a very holistic approach here. Um, and, you know, I can't help but think about, you know, climate change and everything Brian's saying, you know, increased population size, increased need for food, deforestation, because, you know, we're, we're, we need food and then coming into contact with new vectors or new animal reservoirs and all of this. I mean, this is why this is happening. And this is a sign of sort of an out of balance sort of situation. I feel like, um, so we have to take a really like a planetary health perspective, as Dr. Penworth just said, um, with, you know, keeping the planet healthy, and keeping its flora and fauna healthy, right? Including all the animals, which is a great way to prevent human disease. I think that, um, yeah, I, I actually think uh, other than that, which is, I mean, we could talk hours and hours, how do you do that? Um, it is gonna take a lot of behavior change on the, on the side of humans. I think first and foremost, we have to begin with engagement and awareness, right? So working with communities, listening, um, you know, educating on, on certain risks and then letting communities, which are very well endowed to do so, come up with their own solutions to, to decreasing their risk um, and finding perhaps other ways to source food or protein in the areas and helping bring those along, right? In order for us to get back in balance, I think it's gonna take, um, yeah, a lot of, of behavior change. Um, you know, here, you know, what we're talking about, we're talking, you know, I mean, Brian was bringing up, uh, you know, Brian, the, the, you know, the forests of Africa and that edge, right? But the animal source food issue uh, spans everywhere in the world, right? And, and the demand here, for instance, in the US has led to, a, a, you know, the ways that we, you know, we do agriculture, which may necessarily, you know, it puts us at some risk for, for other infections, disease, unhealthy food, and so forth. And so I think it is going to take a lot of behavior change um, and alternatives, right, to what is the here and now. If COVID taught us nothing else, it's that humans can do hard things and we can change our behaviors if we're forced to. In order to change a human's behavior, what you need is you need that human to be motivated by, I think the best motivator of humans, unfortunately, is fear, right? And so if you can, if you can find things that, that really motivate humans other than fear, but, uh, you know, if you can use fear as well, but use, you know, use what you can in order to get people to really, you know, see what they're doing. Maybe there's alternatives to what they're doing that might be safer, better for them, better than for the planet, better for the animals around. People will do it. They, no one really is intentionally trying to harm themselves or communities or the animals of the planet, right? So I think it really becomes about awareness, education, and empowerment of local communities. Yeah, and, and the fear might, yeah. fear might get people to pay attention, but it has to be a sustainable motivation. Otherwise, when the fear goes away, then the, the behavior change stops. Exactly. Too. They go right back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Dr. May, what about you? How do you see you know, the, the solution here? And, and I want, also want to ask you, do you see differences in different geographies when you're dealing with a disease like blue tongue in terms of how people respond to it and want to control it? Yeah. I mean, I think that... Um, I really like that comment, Dr. Laval, about fear. <laughs> um, I think it it can be a motivator, and we've in communities that that I work with often finding the incentivized program um, that can, you know, I love this combination of 
the fear to incentivize and sustain. Um, and often, you know, that comes at the trade-offs of who's going to incentivize it. <laughs> um, you know, and that's the questions that we come up with in trying to to create those those opportunities. But another part that I think just to highlight though is co-creating. And when you co-create with the community of interest, it often gets so much more buy-in and feedback mm -hmm. for the sustainable program. Then, um, and I've had to learn this the hard way, of course. Uh, you know, butting up against different communities and wildlife, livestock, and all the things, having that communication infrastructure of me learning as well as as them and being, hum you know, humble <laughs> at the very least. I think showing that vulnerability. I love, I know, Dr. Bird you show that level of vulnerability with your communities as well uh, that I've seen. And it just goes so far um, in terms of being able to, to have that language barrier and or communication structure come together. Um, but then speaking to, yeah, different community structures, you know, vector-borne disease, as we all know, the, the vectors, you can't talk to them. <laughs> they don't, you know, have a, a structure of communication that I can get across yet. So. Um, I'm being a little funny there, but definitely I think different communities have responded um, in a different way. So endemic viruses or circulating viruses, um, you know, we often, I have to say probably most people don't think much of it. Um, there might be an outbreak in an IE population every now and then, but when something like blue tongue virus eight hits Europe, of course that gets a lot of attention. And, you know, we're talking economic direct impacts to the animals, economic loss because of production issues, and then trade. Um, so you're talking a lot of big things <laughs> that, can, that different communities will respond very differently. And, and so, you know, without getting too much in the weeds on that, I do think it's definitely something to get all the stakeholders to the table. Um, and that's something I've also noticed is being very humble when you have maybe missed a stakeholder that you did you weren't aware of yet but allowing them to come into the, the community the culture and i'd love to hear other people's take on that as well but um, again a learning process of how to get people motivated um i guess is the best word yeah no i couldn't agree more i mean do others want to share experiences of local engagement with communities that they found where they learned something they didn't expect or found that there was really good buy-in of a strategy. So I think that's also really important here. Yeah, I could share something on that. Maybe um, it was it was going to be a feature of the loss of fever part of the talk that I, I didn't have time to do. But you know, in, in the work in West Africa, uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Liberia, you know, working through both the Ebola epidemic uh, when I was with CDC and now at UC Davis later doing uh, research projects at the Wildlife Human Interface. You know, what, what's been interesting and surprising to me, um, especially focused on loss of fever. So this is a rodent-borne disease, um, also related to food issues, though, because the rodents themselves are a food source in these areas, uh, especially for younger younger kids and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's it's the surprise has come in that people recognize uh, that the rodents they call them rats they're not quite rats but they look like rats um, are are a source of this virus, uh, but they know that it's also an important food source for them, protein energy food source. And when we've talked with them about that, you know, it's their perspectives on how uh, just the disease causation process works, you know, in their uh, uh, both uh, intellectual and, and, and uh, psychological framework for how they perceive the world can be different than how we as uh, Westerners educated kind of more in the, you know, Francis Bacon-esque uh, science uh, principles, it's, it's quite different. So you have to adapt how you communicate to certain communities and how you uh, value in their perceptions, right? Because what matters is how they perceive the world, not how I perceive the world. Um, you know, and and well, the, the real surprise in that is that, you know, for that project, you know, we're working on vaccines, back to the vaccine concept, vaccines to eliminate Lhasa from the reservoir species. So vaccines for the rodents. Uh, to somehow suppress uh, spillover of that virus in those communities. And you know, people have been remarkably receptive to that concept. Uh, 
you know, in, in the general principles, uh, even uh, having to adapt it to their uh, you know, psychological framework for how disease processes work. Uh, that, that's been very interesting and fascinating to me from essentially a, a medical anthropology perspective. And I think it's changed uh, our work under PREDICT and now this loss of fever project has changed how I, how I personally value and appreciate to those perspectives. That's great. I mean, it, I'm, I was struck by um, during work in Liberia, looking at Ebola in bats, there was a, an understanding by the public that bats um, were potential reservoirs for this virus, but bats are an important food resource as well. And I was sitting in the office of the Minister of Health and she said on the hotline that they had for Ebola, one of the most common questions that came through was, during the outbreak was when can we eat bats again? <laughs> you know, is it, is it safe to go back to eating bats? And so, it, you know, it, it really drives home how important, um, you know, how to balance the, the need and the importance that the animals play in the culture and lives of people locally, um, whether it's for food or, or traditional medicine or anything else versus what we perceive as a risk for what could potentially be a catastrophic event, but from a day-to-day -day basis may not be perceived as risky at all. Others? Yeah, I was just gonna kind of echo what Dr. Mayo said, which is the co-creation piece, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in our work, being in the field for many, many years, it only works when you're co-creating, right? When all the important stakeholders are sitting there around the table and you're trying to find those solutions that are both culturally appropriate, acceptable at all the different you know, levels from all the different people who might be at that table, right? And just, um, I, I find my role is just to, um, you know, maybe to bring what, what we've, you know, gleaned from our scientific perspective about specific risks and the knowledge we have in order to just give a little bit infor more information in order to, you know, together come up with solutions that will work wherever you are. And they're going to be different no matter where you are, because the people are different wherever you are. And so it really comes down to exactly what everybody's been saying, which is getting that community buy-in, right? Right. And along those lines, you know, if we talk about, um, again, the, the relative risks of hunting, eating wildlife versus livestock production, and we think about with livestock production, at least the potential for developing biosecurity around even smallholder farms, how do we approach or how have you approached ideas of shifting dietary um, activity? I don't want to say preference, but you know, in some locations, people think encouraging more domestic animal production is a solution to mitigating the risk of disease transmission through bushmeat hunting and wildlife. Have you had experience in, in working within those systems, talking about those kinds of shifts or seeing areas where domestic animal production is increasing um, relative to historical levels and, and how people are thinking about disease? And that's open to any of the panelists. I think it's often couched as a, a solution, particularly in areas, I know, you know, West Africa just being one example, but not the only one where um, societies rely heavily on wildlife as a source of protein. And there isn't particularly a lot of domestic animal production, but it's starting to change and we're starting to see that growth. And as we see in other parts of the world where livestock production is more dominant, um, you know, there's a transition period that goes from smallholder farms to bigger farming systems, eventually intensified farming. And that dynamic process comes a lot with a lot of risk in terms of disease transmission. And so how do, we, how do we think about managing those risks along the growth trajectory if that indeed is a process that occurs in a certain area? Yeah, I, you know, I think you know, from my experience, uh, like as you mentioned in West Africa, you know, there, there aren't the vet, maybe on the poultry side, there are some larger uh, production units, but for pigs and cows and goats and things, it's still all smallholder farming, but you can tell as the communities, and maybe Dr. Penrith gives an insight on this, yeah, as, as those three countries in particular, the ones where, where I've worked the most, uh, their economies uh, are recovering from Ebola and now COVID. So, you know, thinking forward five years or so, I could envision a time when these smallholder farmers get together and start doing more uh, uh, commercialized production. Um, you know, it, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind about the situation that occurred with Nipah virus, 
uh, across uh, South Asia and the intensification of pig production and the contact there with uh, uh, fruit bats and pigs and the obvious uh, disastrous consequences of that. And that really comes back to biosecurity and how you try to mitigate contact of li domesticated livestock with wild animals uh, because wild animals are smart, right? They're gonna follow the food. Uh, right. You know, if you plant the fruit trees as shade around the pigs, oops, okay, you're gonna get bats, eat the fruit. If you have a bunch of pig chow on the ground, uh, you're gonna have a bunch of rats, oops, okay, that's bad. Uh, but I guess we should also not forget, I mean, my, my, my world, I think about, you know, hemorrhagic fever viruses and kind of these crazy, crazy, highly pathogenic things, but the domesticated animals themselves are not without attendant health risks, right? Um, a lot more people are affected by salmonella uh, across the world than ever by Ebola. And that's a wonderful, uh, uh, that's a good thing, I guess. Uh, but, you know, the, just for having more chickens or pigs or whatnot is not, um, well, you might reduce risk of Lhasa and Ebola. You've, you've now increased our classic foodborne disease illnesses, which uh, are hugely impactful at the public health level. Over. Yeah, and, and you know, we should also talk about the idea of not just raising domestic animals in the traditional sense, but in the context of, of China and, and a lot of the discussion around SARS and SARS-CoV-2, the idea of wildlife farms is important. And again, that's occurring throughout Asia and, and other parts of the world as well, is raising um, wildlife species domestically. And you know, what do we know about the risks there in terms of their contact with wild animals, the use of wild stock to supplement those farms? What kind of, I guess the question to the panel is, where do we need to go in terms of our surveillance systems and, and the safeguards we have in place along the way as, as different farming systems are developing and commercial value chains are developing so that we're making sure that we're tracking the spread of known veterinary diseases or zoonotic diseases to new geographies through commercial trade or the emergence of new diseases along those routes. Where do we need to focus those efforts? I'm not exactly sure how, but I can say that I think one very important thing would be where that's done. And I think the closest you can get to those small scale farmers or where those animals are is better. So I think again, out in, perhaps there's a, a role for more capacity building and more uh, infrastructure around sort of early detection of pathogens. And again, I sound like a broken record, but community engagement and empowerment so that, you know, people can learn, like I mentioned in my talk to actually, you know, find those risks themselves and start to deal with it. Again, I think there have been uh, great strides in doing this. A lot of people on the panel are, are doing this, but I think the closer we can get to the animal, I think the better we are off for preparedness, right? Yeah, and Christy, where are we at, at pen side diagnostics and point of care diagnostics, which I think is something that would be really useful in a lot of these efforts. Yeah, and that's a very interesting question <laughs> because uh, there was a, a nice um, a symposium that was held at, at K-State, I think a number of years ago, maybe two or three, but we were talking about active pen side and like lamp technologies and, and things of that nature. And then even to the point of like the MinION, um, sequencing technologies. The question would be, as, as it came up in the room, it gives you a lot of information, but if you have just these big panels, what information is actually important? And um, should you have a diagnostician on the other end helping and facilitating that discussion, which um, for job security, I would say, of course, you need that. Um, now for, you know, in terms of where we've gone, and I won't mention tests by name, um, but there are some pin side diagnostics out there and available. The thing that concerns me, and I, I just think coming back full circle is enriching the education. So, of course, you know, as a veterinarian, you don't want um, producers to have to spend an enormous amount of money just to talk to you. <laughs> you want to be facilitating the engagement to work with those folks. However, you definitely want to make sure they're getting the right sample type. Um, that's a conversation that I'm having all the time. And, and then along with the right sample type, making sure it's tr being treated appropriately. So putting the right buffer, putting the right chain of custody, how, however it, it needs to go. And so, you know, I think pin side diagnostics are coming online. There are some, again, commercially available. Um, but that being said, I always try to promote from a diagnostician side that 
let's meet in the middle and <laughs> co-create this plan together. Uh, let me help you get the right sample type for your herd and or, you know, even on the small animal side, there's also um, several available diagnostics. But uh, along with that <laughs> is not only all the sample type thing that I'm talking about, but, you know, kit inserts come for a reason and making sure that all that's being followed to the wire, you know, from leaving kits out for a certain amount of time to putting them back in the refrigerator. And, and that preservation, you know, there's a sensitive line of when you need to make sure that everything's being held to the T. Um, so yeah, I think we're getting there, um, but still it comes back to that. I think the common theme of this, as we talk about epidemiology and ecology and prevention and control, communication is what I'm hearing a lot of, um, having the right communication and the importance of it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's certainly an important theme in terms of cross-sectoral communication. So animal health sector communicating with human health sector and, and with other important stakeholders and laboratory networks. But, but staying with the, the lab and diagnostic question, you know, I, I'm always amazed in the work that I've done with scientists and veterinarians in particular in, in low resource countries. Um, they have an amazing ability to diagnose diseases based on symptomology, you know, and it, they're, they're just certain common things that are what they are based on certain signs. And, and that's a skill they're taught because they don't have the luxury necessarily of diagnostic tests. But in, in, in our world of, new disease discovery, novel viruses emerging, you know, things that cause similar syndromes that might be different pathogens. Where does the technology need to go and at what level for accurate diagno diagnosis, whether it's getting genome level data on, on etiologic agents for different diseases? Um, if the panel could comment, and I'll address this to, to you, Christy, and also Brian, just on the virology background, but what do we need in terms of level of technology and at what point along the diagnostic chain to be better at early detection and response when emergence occurs? Yeah, I, well, and at the bird, I'd love to hear your comments on this as well. And, um, you know, I think listening to the, um, the session on diagnostics earlier in the week, uh, there's everything from nanoparticles to, <laughs> you know, uh, application of next generation sequencing. And I will say six years in this position, I, I um, have been utilizing next generation sequencing for further characterization. Um, and I, you know, we've, we're on the spectrum of trying to get this as a diagnostic tool, um, but it is a very intensive process, you know, in terms of how much genetic material, and I love this comment about syndromes, um, very astute clinicians could probably diagnose something, you know, without needing, um, a test and then clinically treating it probably most appropriately for that particular client. But coming back to it, you know, the kitchen sink of next generation sequencing, I do think it's very important for further characterization, but we also have to harness it as the tool it is um, and maybe not over simplifying <laughs> how complicated it can be. Um, but I'll pitch it to Dr. Bird because I'd love to hear your comments. Um, um... <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks, Dr. Mario. Yeah, th this is maybe the central challenge uh, of our time as scientists working in this space on how how do well one how do we detect the things we know about? So the rifts, the CCHFs, the losses, the uh, even the bolas and things, right? So there, there's a multitude of technologies, you know, from tried and true, you know, regular RT PCR, out to the uh, NGS to nanoparticle, you name it, there's technology out there, right? Most of which I can't understand myself and I graduated from the 25th grade, you know, so, uh, but so that makes it a real challenge to implement a lot of those technologies uh, at the pointy end of the stick. And so we have to look across the spectrum of technologies and what could be utilized at various, both technical and infrastructural levels. Uh, you know, when we're looking now at the novel viruses, okay, the technologies, uh, the, the subset, it kind of, it, it's a redacted subset of what technologies might be utilized. Most of them requiring even more, you know, higher end uh, laboratories. So, you know, part of that is uh, in the projects uh, we're all involved in, I think, ensuring that we're leaving behind increased laboratory and technical capacities in whatever we're doing is key. Uh, 
Uh, I think systematically, I know, you know USAID, CDC, other global health security agenda partners, WHO, FAO, OIE, have been trying to build laboratory capacities across uh, the world for many years now. And I think thinking rationally how we continue to do these surveillance projects and beta test and test these different technologies at different levels of, of entree, you know, from, from the pin side to, you know, regional hub labs, you know, kind of the Uganda Virology Institutes of the World or ICDDRB, Bangladesh, you know, these places really you know, very hardcore, high intensity laboratories. Uh, because each country will have its own solutions, right? So the way the Ministry of Health or Agriculture work in different countries, well, they will have their own different priorities of about, well, if, if you're coming in with a project and you wanna use a particular technology, where should we place that? And I think building that partnership with those ministries uh, or departments or you know, whatever they're called in the country where you work is critical so that you're actually training the right people. Because the last thing we want to do is you know, bring the, you know, $150,000 gizmo to a country, train two folks to use it, and then five minutes after the project is over, no one remembers anything. Uh, that, that is absolutely the wrong thing uh, to do uh, to help protect us, us, the global us, from these emerging pathogens. It's, it's, a, it's a critical thing and couldn't be stressed enough, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Penrith, you do a lot of work with FAO and OIE, and, and I'm curious what you've seen in, um, in the veterinary sector or the animal, you know, livestock production sector in response to um, ASF outbreaks, but also the, the request or need for more advanced diagnostics or different diagnostic approaches to dealing with livestock and zoonoses from the domestic animal health side. What are you, what are you seeing on the ground? Yes, it, it varies a lot from country to country in Africa. And um, I can very much relate to what Dr. Berg was saying about the, you know, capacity building that's done. And then as soon as they, they haven't got the money to run it or they can't do it, it, it all falls apart and you find this laboratory that can't do anything. Or um, what we found a lot in Mozambique, for example, was that a lot of our staff were sent overseas to laboratories to train in particular techniques. They came back, uh, they didn't have the technique there. And we, I actually started suggesting that we should rather bring experts to look at what they've got and tell them how to use it properly. But even when you, you know that they are trained and so on, they don't get the practice because you don't get the samples because people aren't educated to send in samples or there's a cost involved and they can't cover the cost. So, so that's quite a problem. Um, one of our biggest problems is that uh, the more sophisticated techniques, uh, some of the laboratories just can't support them. They, they couldn't use PCRs because the, the risk of contamination would be much too high. Um, some of the old techniques specifically for diagnosing African swine fever, like um, the immunofluorescent antibody test, because most of the laboratories, the national ones at any rate, were equipped to diagnose rabies using that technology. They, did, they could do that and it's pretty robust. And what they were normally doing with, dealing with was very acute cases where you'd have lots of virus and it would be fine. But because of the whole Spanish situation about the chronic disease and the vaccine induced stuff and that these pigs had antibodies and, oh, well, you can't diagnose the chronic stuff with that test, you must get something better. Uh, no, it was perfectly fine for our purposes. <laughs> and, um, I think, unfortunately, there isn't really much of a culture of getting a sample to the laboratory. So I really like the idea of the syndromic surveillance because at least you could be alerted to the fact that there is something and eventually somebody might decide, look, I think we better go and take samples and find out what it is or what it's not. Um, the other thing is that, um, 
a lot of countries in Africa, I had the problem in Mozambique, that when we had an outbreak of African swine fever, you know, we could confirm it, but I wanted to have the sequencing done. I wanted to know what, what it was. And that had to be done at Ornestiport, which really wasn't terribly far away. But we could not find a courier who would carry any infected biological material or potentially infected. So I simply became a smuggler of note. I mean, I would just take the samples through and lie about what I had in my cool box if I had to at the border. And I don't like doing that sort of thing. I mean, I knew enough to know that I wouldn't be stupid enough to go and then feed the samples to a pig or throw them away where a pig could get them. It was a perfectly safe way of transmitting them, but it certainly wasn't legal. And But a lot of the labs just cannot get the samples to a reference laboratory because of couriers not wanting to cooperate. And they were actually going far beyond the outer regulations because they said that animal, animal samples could be transported if it wasn't suspected to be a zoonotic disease, but they wouldn't do it. So that's, there are a lot of challenges. And also, for instance, Papua New Guinea, well, they didn't have capacity to diagnose African swine fever at all, but eventually they got the, the ability to use the Pennside test, but the samples, it's going to be set up there, but the samples were having to go to Australia. So that was quite a long delay between when the samples were collected and when an answer actually was received, by which time the disease could have spread. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question really, but well, I think you're you're listing some important barriers sometimes to mm. doing diagnostics, even if technology exists, because you're starting with a culture of sample collection, the logistical hurdles of moving it. I think you're you're speaking to the importance, perhaps, of the pen side or point of care point testing. Of care so you don't have to get samples to a lab, um, and and that's a technologic answer, perhaps, to to some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also talking about a cultural challenge, which is that of practitioners, you know, thinking about mm. laboratories as part of a diagnostic process or even having that available. And, and so let me ask the panel, in your own experiences with the disease systems you work on, what needs to happen in terms of workforce development or, you know, scientific training um, in various disciplines that are needed to tackle some of these issues? Where do you see the biggest need for changes in the way we approach disease? Um, Dr. LeBeau, let me start with you. Kind of leading off the, the last, um, what we were just talking about, something that kept coming to my mind, and I'm sure other people on the panel have perhaps a lot more experience in this than me, but you know, I think w one of the most important things that we need to continue to work on and which we're not really trained to do well as a scientist, especially as a physician like I am, is actually creating uh, work and knowledge that actually impacts policy. I think the policy piece is huge and it's really um, it, on so many levels. I mean, um, from international policies to national policies. I mean, just talking about what we're talking about, the regulations, um, driving you know, the top 10 things on a country's list of what they care about, right? There's a lot of things countries care about, right? And it's different all over the world. And so you know, if, if, if you really believe that this thing is very important, then it's, you know, creating the, the scientific knowledge and then translating it into sort of uh, uh, really policy briefs or conversations with policymakers that actually drive policy and bring that scientific knowledge to the forefront when they're, you know, um, deciding what they're gonna work on and, and what they're gonna build their lab capacities in and what they're gonna educate their populations about. And, um, you know, I think it's really, for me, I think policy is, is, is crucial and, and I don't think we get enough training in, in this. Yeah, and the, the science communication becomes so important because uh, so many policymakers are, are bureaucrats and not technical. And so it's, it's that much more critical that we can translate research and understanding to them. Um, what about others? Dr. Mayo, what do you see as a need in terms of workforce development training? Well, you know, I, I'm really happy that you brought up the policy. I had not thought about that in that context, but definitely, definitely important. Um, I think there is a nice training program 
for diagnosticians, I think, you know, the workforce for us is just, you know, in the community is making sure we have enough as people retire <laughs> to have diagnosticians that are going to be replenishing some of our, our jobs and things of that nature. Um, but in terms of, you know, potentially crossing the span of where I am now, I think getting folks to have that diversity, especially as we talk circle back to ecology and epidemiology, um, I'd love to hear from others, but what I've gained a grasp for is learning along the way this like maybe hidden talent or trying to find it of communication. Again, I come back to that because you're spanning so many different topics. And what I'd like to bring it back to, and especially like in the EID program, um, you're talking to everyone from modelers to theoretical ecologists to empirical scientists. And then I think we all could agree, you know, you have to umbrella that. Um, and while it's been supremely rewarding, I think, um, you know, again, coming back to the policy as well as just kind of that communication piece, um, getting people trained in that capacity could be very helpful. <laughs> um, but turn it over to others. Ryan? Yeah, um, I would add, <clears throat> yeah, I agree completely with uh, what Desiree was mentioning about uh, encouraging people to uh, both get training, but also understand and, and, and practice a communicating science to policymakers is, is an extremely important thing. Because uh, it's at the policy level is where the priorities are set and where the funding streams will flow within uh, many of the countries where I work and, and here in the United States as well, obviously. Um, you know, so that that is that is a learned skill. Very few people just know how to do that. I think you know, right? so it needs practice. Uh, so uh, you know, the the project leads in the countries uh, where I have footprints. Certainly, uh, we just talk a lot about that. They have a lot of experience doing that now, of talking with their ministerial counterparts, or even up to the presidential level, depending on what the virus findings were. Like for the Bumbalia Ebola virus, uh, we gave presidential level briefings um, um, several times uh, to talk through the issues. You know, and then to uh, Christie's point there about, you know, one thing that is needed, and this is where this is where it would have to come from the funding agencies themselves is, you know, directed targeted training programs where we could develop regional uh, collaboration. So whether it would be, you know, it, it, all my works focus primarily in Africa, so I know it the best, but you know, West African regional network hubs of uh, either laboratories or field ecology teams and building those connections, those peer-peer connections, right? So that my, my teams that, that I'm working with have connections to, you know, teams that Desiree is working with in different places so that they can exchange their own ideas and become peers of each other. Um, you know, this South-South collaboration is, is critical in trying to what's now being called decolonizing global health. Uh, that's a very important thing to because we're at a stage now where um, science and disease ecology, virus surveillance and the like should be bubbling up and can be bubbling up from the grassroots in the countries where these diseases exist. Uh, you know, the, I think a lot of agencies are starting to look towards that as a paradigm uh, and because that will be sustainable then if you can link train teams across countries to work together in a regional fashion, well, that also helps that become a priority for the policymakers so that then the Ministry of Agriculture says, okay, you know, African swine fever, that actually is important. Uh, you know, if we want to feed people, we need a bunch of pigs. And if all the pigs are dying all the time of African swine fever virus, oops, that, well, that's not sustainable. Oops. Uh, you know, so that will help a lot, I think, in, in that sorry, unified uh, collaborative regional approach. Yes, and, and just a comment from, uh, from the audience, uh, Margaret Allen making the point that communication with the public becomes critically important as well as to policymakers, you know, being able to make sure that, you know, society is understanding what scientists are, you know, learning and being communi and communicating to policymakers so that there's buy-in at population level and, we could spend a whole day talking about communication issues around the COVID emergence and, and pandemic. Um, that's information was definitely you know, challenging with that. 
Um, Dr. Penrith, I just wondered if you had uh, comments as well in terms of where development, workforce development needs to be focused for a lot of these issues. Well, I think everything that's been said so far is true, and policy really is incredibly important, and talking to policymakers, because, uh, I mean, we have the situation, and thank you, Dr. Bird, for saying, picking African swine fever as an example of a disease that's important, because that didn't happen to us, because, for instance, African swine fever, the work of the African swine fever working group in South Africa got clean, pushed clean off the agenda of our national veterinary department when a small outbreak of foot and mouth disease occurred just outside the infected area because this was going to have a far higher impact on trade, although it has no impact whatsoever on the cattle. But um, I think, well, certainly in Africa, the veterinary services do need a lot more capacitation, but not only that, the profession has to be made much more attractive for them because in many, many African countries, it's not attractive to them. It's a, In some, it's a cultural thing that working with animals is not something that is considered very um, respectable or, and, you know, a lot of parents will say, you want to be a vet? No, I'll help you become a doctor, but not a vet. That's nonsense. You can't just be a, a, a cattle worker. And yet they know the animals are important and they are culturally and, and nutritionally important. But um, we're very short of veterinarians in the field, you know, and I talk about syndromic surveillance, it's good, but vast, vast, vast num numbers of these people who farm with animals have absolutely no access to veterinarians whatsoever. And one thing that would help the workforce a lot, and it's been tried, but unfortunately they are expected to be self-sustaining and then it can collapse, is your community-based animal health workers who are people from the community, who are chosen by the community, who are interested and are a bit knowledgeable about animals and animal diseases and who are there to daily provide basic, they get capacitated to provide you might say primary animal health care, and they can then say, oh, this is something worse than what I normally deal with. Now I had better get on my cell phone, because at least most people in Africa have a cell phone, and talk to that animal health technician who we saw three months ago, or the extension officer who we saw a month ago, and tell them, I think something bad is wrong here. Somebody needs to come and look, and I'll send you a photo on my phone. And I think that sort of coming from the community up is the only way we're going to get things right and have an integrated workforce for animal health, vigilance, disease prevention, reporting, and in general improvement of animal health well-being. And the other thing that was mentioned is a good collaboration and exchange of knowledge between the medical and the animal health people, because and in, in South Africa, we've got one initiative where we have a clinic in the interface area next to the Kruger Park. It's a veterinary clinic, and there's also a human clinic. And they coordinate electives, or not really elective, but clinic rotations by veterinary students and medical students who for those two weeks uh, eat together, talk together, see what each other are doing. And I think it's a very positive thing. But you'll find, we found that this is the psychosis um, uh, tapeworm, pink tapeworm project, that some of the clinics in those areas were not even aware that there was such a disease. I mean, there'd only be a nurse in those clinics, not a, a doctor. And they would see cases of epilepsy, but have no idea that it could possibly be due to the presence of pigs in the community and contamination and so on. So um, I think the One Health approach is, is key, but also just having more people, extension services as well, perhaps more trained in animal diseases, because we do have extension services and agricultural extension services. But in Mozambique, we found that the, the extension services from really well-informed extension officers who came forward and said, yes, yes, we have so many pig farmers and they're doing this and that, to 
a couple of them who said in different villages, I don't think we've got any pigs and you and the, and you'd have to introduce them to the pig farm. So, you know, it's got to be just a, we need to really beef up what the people can do and the people who are there on the ground and then get a kind of a, should we say, a vertical integration of surveillance so that eventually the vets do find out in time that something's going wrong. I don't know if that answered the question. No, all. no, look, these are, these are big challenges. And, and going to wrap up with a final question to the panel. Um, before I do, though, I just want to thank each of you for really thoughtful responses to the questions. This is an important discussion. I think you can see we have a, a large audience. We have people from all over the world listening to this. Everyone has challenges that are, you know, related but different depending on the context they're in. And I think these, these big picture discussions are important in terms of where we go as a scientific community for addressing disease challenges, whether they're animal diseases or zoonotic. And so let me leave you with this. And I think Dr. Pendrith, you were touching on many of these things, but, you know, for people listening to this conversation who are in graduate school, who are early career scientists, or even you know undergrads or, or younger, and are thinking about health, what are the lessons we've learned? Again, as we're in the midst of a global pandemic, you know, we talk about detect early detection being so important. Well, sometimes even early detection or detection at all isn't enough to stop transmission and spread. So, what are the lessons that we've learned about disease control, whether it's in animals, whether it's transmission from wildlife to people or to livestock? But what are the lessons we need to carry forward and give to the next generation of scientists, diagnosticians, health practitioners, researchers, what have you, to really deal with these big global challenges around health? What are the lessons we need to confer? So Dr. LeBeau, I'll start with you. Great, I'm glad I don't have to go last because I'm sure everyone's gonna say everything wonderful. <laughs> but I'll start and say, um, just what we've been talking about here, right? Like not, I think the biggest lesson is not having a narrow perspective. I think people go furthest in their work when they uh, work alongside people with very different perspectives, interests, expertise than, than they have. I think everyone always talks about interdisciplinary science, but um, I've learned that, you know, if you silo yourself, you, you cut off access to all of the knowledge and the expertise that's available. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, common cross interests. So I would say for young folks starting out, you know, don't silo yourself. You know, when you get into that PhD program or you go to medical school or whatever, you know, work with lots of different people. Um, these questions, the ones of zoonotics and, and these emerging infections, they are centered in sort of a planetary health perspective, right? There's a huge planetary health movement going on. Everything is interrelated with everything. And so I think um, really uh, keeping yourself open to, to you know, all of, all of the, the knowledge that's around you. And then, as we've said a thousand times in, in this panel, listening, right? Like truly listening. People sometimes think they come with the answers, but really, if you just be quiet, sit with, with people on the ground who, who have been living with whatever it is for much longer, you can find out so much about how to tackle these problems and, and what are the, the, you know, sort of the low hanging fruit of the next step to do to kind of push forward the next solution. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mayo, over to you. Yeah, so um, expanding upon that is just also uh, being curious. You know, I think that's the the um, ultimate where we say people go the furthest is stretching the boundaries, probably. And being again, I've used the word vulnerable, but that's what I've found in the as I've become more of that in the career of just asking that question, even if it sounds completely off the charts and ludicrous, um, and creating that environment around you. I think you know, every stage of your career, um, that can really help break down the barriers and come together and get people of very diverse backgrounds, solving a solution and a problem. And if anything, uh, as we all learn in grad school, it all is going to come back to that question you have to define. <laughs> and so if you start that curiosity of asking multiple questions, you can always guide your path to be a little bit more secure when you go to ask that big question in your undergrad thesis or your graduate program. Um, and so 
anyways, I, I'll pitch it over to somebody else, but the curiosity component can go a long way. <laughs> Great, Dr. Penrith. I think it's important to be, to be humble and to be receptive as, and as Dr. Mayer said, to be curious and to, to work with people from other, to learn that there are people from other disciplines who can teach you something. And always also to think before you do something, advise something, what are the likely consequences of this for this person or this community? So that, um, I mean, vets used to do the most awful things in the old days, like with, with trypanosomiasis. They wanted to destroy all the wild animals and all the natural bush because it could harbor tsetse flies and you wouldn't want that, would you? I mean, you're going to farm with cattle there. And fortunately it didn't work. Just like shooting all the warthogs didn't work for African swine fever. And I don't think we do things like that, but we still do let ourselves be encouraged to put up great big fences to, to separate cattle from wildlife. And when there are other ways that could be dealt with foot and mouth disease, including um, debunking it as a disease altogether, but I won't go there. But, um, the, and whatever it is, whether you're going to um, recommend a treatment, can the person afford it? Is it going to result in them putting an animal into the food chain where the withdrawal period hasn't been respected because they don't understand that? Whatever you do, be willing to, it's a conversation, it's not an order. And you also need to find out what their experience of this thing is and how they would feel it should, if you like, would like it to be dealt with. And if that's possible, then but as a sort of a cooperative animal health effort rather than I'm the veterinary, you know what to do. Thank you. Important to listen, thank you. And Brian, over to you for the last word. Yeah, I, I would echo completely what the other panelists have said. All those things are absolutely critical. Uh, you know, listening, being humble, being curious, uh, realizing what you think you know and what you actually don't know and what the other folks might know better than you, I, I think is absolutely important, especially as you're coming up through your training program. And I, I, I would add on one thing, you know, much of science, especially in uh, diagnostics, vaccine development, pathogenesis in particular, is very molecular, right? That's a, you're studying very uh, fine pathways uh, of interactions, sometimes with the subcellular levels, molecular biology and the like, you know, and that, that is all wonderful. And I've done a lot of that myself, uh, but I challenge every student listening, if there's students on this call, that if they're not at some point, at some stage in their training, getting out there to where the diseases actually exist as real entities, not uh, cell cultures of arrow E6 cells or some organ on a chip thing or some reverse genetic system uh, where you're manipulating, you know, transcription promoters. You know, diseases are entities that impact people and animals. It's an organismal level thing and it starts and ends in the communities. And if you're missing that part in your training, you have missed out. Uh, so seek out uh, mentors, uh, laboratories, potential collaborators that are doing that work that would enable you to have that opportunity. Because if you don't get that in your training pro uh, program at some stage, you're really missing the holistic piece that I, for me is the sustainable piece. For me, that's my sustainable piece, is talking to um, um, community members, other people, stakeholders that are impacted by these things. Um, and that's what makes me keep wanting to work at it when you're bashing your head against the biosafety cabinet trying to figure out why is this thing not working. Uh, you know, so do that. I highly encourage that. So there you go. Fantastic. I couldn't agree more. And thank you all. Um, thanks again to the panel. I mean, again, this is, you know, these are big issues in terms of disease transmission across the board. And I think that you know, just to try to synthesize what we've heard today from the different presentations is that 
infectious disease and particularly emerging diseases, zoonoses, but even enzootic, you know, veterinary diseases are complex issues. So multidisciplinary efforts are absolutely what's necessary nowadays, approaching these challenges from different angles, whether it's the the molecular virology, the epidemiology, the, the social engagement with communities who are the main stakeholders when it comes to these diseases. They're ultimately, Brian, as you were saying, gonna be the most motivated to tackle these challenges from personal investment. I mean, communities are the ones with skin in the game when it comes to this, but so too is the global community when it comes to, to larger pandemic risk pathogens. And so from a global health perspective, I think understanding that we have to start, to, we have to continue, you know, the, the movement around One Health, which has really gained a lot of traction, I would say, not a new concept necessarily, but certainly in the past 10, 20 years, more and more traction by governments around the world, by practitioners in other parts of the world, starting to even here in the United States. But the idea that not only do we have to work together, but we got to chip away at some of the barriers that prevent us from working together. And so that's happening and that needs to continue to happen. And it has to include local scientists, local experts, capacity building and strengthening through partnerships is essential because these problems that may start in one part of the world will affect many parts of the world. And so starting with the, the areas that are high risk and working locally with folks to help deal with those problems, but really casting a wide net through collaboration across broad regions to, to deal with these issues. And when we talk about, to me, the issues of pandemic prevention and even climate change are connected in the sense that not only do we think about the impacts of climate change on disease, but the root causes are often the same. Deforestation and carbon sequestration that drives you know, climate change also impacts risk of disease emergence and transmission. So the solutions are also linked. And so if we recognize that and we work towards that, we can have a lot of impact in terms of reducing risk while at the same time recognizing that processes like animal production and the need for animal protein are going to continue. And so we can think about um, risk mitigation strategies while dealing with those. I think we have to continue to focus upstream. All the discussions around diagnostics and vaccines as tools are critical parts of the arsenal, but we do have to keep our eye on the fact that so many times we're caught on the back foot by pandemics that emerge because we find out too late that they're spreading in the community. And so we need to rely, we need to strengthen our ability to really look at those roots of spillover or jumping of zoonotic pathogens, either into livestock or into people. And that happens through looking at high risk behaviors and working within communities that rely on activities that they consider essential for their livelihoods, but that may also carry risk of allowing spillover to occur. And working with local, locally palatable and sensible ideas for reducing risk through those, during those activities. Um, because prevention is ultimately how we're going to avoid getting in situations like we are now with something like COVID. And so, um, I, I think all of that is to say that the, the research we do around infectious diseases is all building towards a, a broader understanding of how complex these issues are. And actually, you know, I was thinking about the recent Ebola outbreak in Guinea and the, the realization that this potentially started from persistent infection five years out from a major epidemic, you know, that there could still be people carrying Ebola virus that could spark an outbreak, not just, you know, another spillover event. We're constantly learning new things about diseases that we've known about for decades. And that speaks to the need to continue to, to apply these, you know, multidisciplinary approaches, the, the research and the study of these diseases so that we're not caught by surprise time after time for not only new diseases, but those we know about. Um, we're always learning new things. And so, of course, an underlying fundamental belief in science and research for informing our approaches to global health and security. So um, a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. But again, I think we had incredible experts today to help us uh, guide us through this conversation. So I want to thank the panel, thank the organizers. Um, Haley, I think I'll hand it back to you to close out the session. And, and let me end with a reminder that tomorrow's conference topic will be on emergency response research. So thanks again to everybody who joined us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Epstein. Thanks everyone who participated in today. A reminder for our attendees, as you exit out of the symposium today, you'll be prompted with a feedback survey. It'll take four minutes to complete and your input really helps us improve future programming. So thank you so much. We hope you'll be able to join us tomorrow.